בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה. First, I'd like to uh, thank Rabbi Zitron and Chacham Shmuli for arranging the shiur, Baruch Hashem. We had this uh, whole uh, tour of shiurei Torah this last week, every night, Baruch Hashem. A different shiur, a different location, a lot of chidushim, a lot of uh, interesting things that Am Yisrael needs to find out, because apparently we're in a generation where on one end, we're in uh, Yemei Mashiach. We're at the end of days, and you don't necessarily need to be too brilliant to realize that we're at the end of days. If you just look at the world around you, you watch the news for five minutes, you realize that the world is not the same anymore. If you want to watch the uh, political world, you notice that in the Gemara Masechet uh, Sota, page 49, it gives you a list of things that are going to happen at the end of times, things that are going to happen right before the Mashiach shows up. I did a shiur about this on Sunday in uh, Staten Island in Otoa, and it's a uh, mamash, we went over each one of the items on the list, and when you read it, it's like reading the newspaper. Mamash, like reading the newspaper. Everything that the Chachamim said is going to happen, is happening. One of them is that the leaders of the world, the political leaders of the world, are going to go against the nation. Now, generally, this is against logic, because the pol politicians are people that, they don't just get their job just because. We have to vote for them. So, if we vote for them, then technically they should serve us. They should do things for our own interest, not for their interest. But as generation after generation, the corruption continues, gets worse and worse. The only difference between today and if you just say, let's say, three or four hundred years ago, is that today they do it with a smile. Today they tell you that they're your friend, please vote for me, vote for a change. And the next thing you know, they're doing everything in their power to destroy your life. One of the recent laws that was passed that's slowly but surely, if Hashem lets it happen, is going to destroy civilization and bring us back to Sodom and Gomorrah stage, is that they passed a law in the United States that now you have to allow children in public schools to go to the bathroom that they feel most comfortable. So if the boy feels comfortable in the girl's bathroom, Ashrav, what's, what's the problem? No one actually thought that rape is going to increase as a result of this. I guess it's a chidush. You have to actually have an IQ of above five to know that this is going to increase crime. But this is why several states, I think it's eight different states, actually have an IQ above five and they realize this is going to happen, so they're suing the government. What's going to happen, we don't know. But you're seeing little by little, society is changing. Less than a year ago, they also passed a law that they wanted to remove the Ten Commandments. There was a, a, a statue of the Ten Commandments. And they wanted to, in a government building, and they wanted to remove it. So we're not only removing logic, but we're also going, we don't really need Hashem anymore. I would not be surprised if the next round of bills that the government prints are no longer going to say, in God we trust. We're going to say, thanks to our hard work, thanks to the president, thanks to the stock market, thanks to whoever they come up with. Not God. Even though, technically, most people that read the dollar bill and they see, in God we trust, they usually think that they mean, oh, it's the dollar is God. Because, unfortunately, in our society... Most people do treat the dollar like it's God. They chase the dollar more and more and more, like I did for much of my life, as if it is God. So when you see that, and on the other end, if you see the war that's happening in the world that's quiet, but it's happening, there are thousands of thousands of people being killed, quietly. If you just look at what's happening in Syria and the civil war that's happening 
No one is mentioning that over 250,000 Syrian citizens died last year by their own government. No one seems to care. No one seems to think this is actually valid or important. And unless you actually look for it, you're not going to find it. So propaganda is increasing also. The only thing you do see on the news on a regular basis is increased anti-Semitism. You're seeing Hashem use his number one tool of anti-Semitism that if anyone wants to look was originally created in Parashat Shmot. In the book of Exodus, the first parasha, it was the first time that anyone specifically went against the Jews. At that time we were Israelites. But anti-Semitism in America, in a recent study, they confirmed that at least 40% of Americans, our allies, are considering themselves anti-Semitic. If our allies are such good friends, you could only wonder what our enemies think of us. But this is all Yad Hashem. This is all in the hands of Hashem. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with them. It has to do with our actions. But Hashem needs to use these tools. It's a hard topic for people to talk about. People don't like it. People don't like to talk about Germany and the Holocaust. But the reality of it is that this happens. This is Hashem. When someone asks, how could Hashem, you know, where was Hashem during the Holocaust? The very simple answer is, He did it. Just like He created man in the beginning of time, and He created the world, and He created the Torah 974 generations before He created the world, He also did this. Nothing different. Why? Because of what He said in the Torah. Last week's parasha, in America we're a little bit of a uh, lag behind Israel. We read parashat Bechukotai. Parashat Bechukotai is one of two parashot in the Torah that people don't really like to read. In our grandparents' generation and previously before that, these two parashot that are full of curses or punishments used to be read extra loud. People would scream them. Instead of just reading them with the regular voice, they would actually yell them out as loud as possible. Why? Because Yir'ah, fear of Hashem, is a necessary foundation in order to believe in Him. If you have no Yir'ah, you have nothing. Chazal says that a connection to Hashem that's only based on Yir'ah is an incomplete connection. It's incomplete. It's good. It's a connection nonetheless. You're still getting some battery power. But it's incomplete. You're not going to get to full power. Your iPhone's going to get to 60%. But a connection to Hashem only based on Ava, only based on love, is no connection at all. It's impossible. There's no such thing. Why? Why does Chazal say it's impossible to just love Hashem and not fear Him? I love Hashem. Everyone thinks they love Hashem. You ask any half-naked woman walking in the street that's half-Jewish or even not, do you love Hashem? She says, yeah, of course I love God. He's the best. Everyone loves God except the atheists that created their own religion of not believing in anything. Which is a different topic of its own. You ask religious people, not religious people, everyone could say I love Hashem. It's very easy to say, I love Hashem. But to show Hashem we love Him is a different story. Chazal says it's impossible to love Hashem without fearing Him. Why? Because you cannot love something when you don't know what it is. Which means that if you knew just a little bit that we can know, we can't really understand Hashem, but the little bit that we can know through His Torah of what He is and what He's in control of which is everything, whether it's the cells in your body or the speech that comes out of your mouth or the money that's in your pocket or the wife you're going to marry or whether you're going to live another week or not or whether you come into the world, male or female, rich or poor, everything is in its power. When you realize he's in control of everything, how could you not fear? 
If I really believed that he's in control of every single thing that moves, every single thing that doesn't move, every single thing that I see, and every single thing that I don't see, everything, of course I'm going to fear him. Because I know that if you, even if you want to look at it just scientifically, we said it in last night's year, every one of us has protein, uh, proteins in our body. Trillions and trillions and trillions of proteins. In order for your body to function, it requires these proteins. Everyone says, eat chicken, eat meat, you yeah, need protein. So, that's the source, but what do we do with these proteins? In your body, you have an infinite amount of proteins. But every one of these proteins needs to go through something called a protein fold. Meaning that they need to fold precisely in a way that's exact. And if they just miss a little bit, miss a little bit. Like, for example, you know, you see this book. If I close it like this, then it's like that. But if you just throw it around, it could close in a little bit of a different way. It's still closed. Not the same with the protein fold. If one, one of these proteins folds a little bit off, just a little, half a centimeter, half a millimeter, Shem that's where disease comes from. Blindness, being crippled, not being able to breathe, not being able to Move blood, not being able to function. Just one. Not trillions, not five, not 500. One. Who's in charge? Who's in charge of folding all of these? The same Hashem. So if I know he's in charge of these protein folds that I never took, you know, never really cared about until now, I should be scared. So if I know just a little bit about Hashem, obviously I have to be scared. Once I'm scared because of the Almighty, then we can start a relationship. Then we can say, okay, now I know what I'm dealing with to some extent. Let's see what else you say. So he gave us a love letter. It's called the Torah. It gives us instructions. Torah in Hebrew also means ora, means instructions. Instructions how to live. Instructions how to succeed. Instructions how to be happy. Instructions how to get to eternal happiness. And also instructions how to get to eternal suffering. Same instructions. Instructions for everything. Everything and anything you could ever want is in the Torah. Anything and everything that has any good in it has to have a source in the Torah. Whether it's a statement, a thought, anything has to have a source in the Torah. Nothing new is created under the sun as Shlomo Amelech has told us. So now, once we've started this relationship, fearing Hashem is the beginning. Eventually that fear gets to a point where you start kind of liking Him too. Little by little, maybe you fall in love. Like when you fall in love with your wife, Bezat Hashem, when anyone's not married, may you have a zivug right away, keep us away from sins and Get us to do the first mitzvah in the Torah. Boo, boo. We need more Jews. Fall in love. In the beginning, it's passionate. It's nice. It's amazing. But if you ask a newlywed couple how much they love each other, they'll tell you a lot. How much do you know about each other? Not so much. Because you don't have experience. But if you ask an old rabbi, 75 years old, 80 years old, it's been with his wife for 60 years. How much do you love your wife? Psst. Can't describe it. A lot? A lot. That was uh, 60 years ago was a lot. A lot? What's a lot? She's, she's part of me. How much do you know about your wife? Nothing. How do you know nothing? Because everything that I know about is not enough because there's so much more to her. Discovering her new over and over again. She's amazing. That's what you can see, Mamash. You see the love between an old Rav and his wife is much, much better than a 20-year-old that just got married and thinks that he uh, won the lotto. 
Why? Because the connection has moved from physical to spiritual. And a spiritual connection is eternal. And that takes time. So little by little we gain this love. But eventually we get to a stage of the highest level of Yirah, the highest level of fearing of Hashem, which is not fearing of punishment only, but fearing of hurting the connection. Hurting the connection between us. A person is not going to raise his, wife, his voice to his wife, if he's a normal human being, not because he's afraid she's going to slap him, if she's a normal human being, hopefully she's not going to slap him, but because he fears that it's going to hurt the connection. Someone gets to a point where they don't want to sin, not because they fear that Hashem is going to punish them in this world, next world, and all of these things. They fear that maybe I'm going to disconnect from Him. And anyone that knows even a little bit about connecting to Hashem knows that disconnecting from Him for even a minute is mamash genom in this world. Without Hashem in your life, you have zero. I lived like that most of my life. And you only know the value of something when you don't have it. Once you got to the highest level of Ira, which is fearing, hurting the connection, then you can begin to think about loving Hashem. Then, the highest level of Ira, according to Chazal, is the beginning of loving Hashem. It's the beginning of Avat Hashem. So how come you hear so many teachers, rabbis, and so on, writing books and teaching about how you should love Hashem, love Hashem, love Hashem, love Hashem? I don't know. I can't really answer for all of them. All I can tell you is that it's an illusion for most people in our generation to start with loving Hashem. It's just not possible, according to Chazal. Not me. It's not my opinion. Eventually you can get there, and eventually you should get there. And that's what you're supposed to, mamash, mesirut nefesh, sacrifice your life to get there. But nonetheless, one of the major issues we have in our generation today is that because we are constantly trying to fit in, we've become a politically correct society. In a politically correct society, you cannot find the truth. In a politically correct, correct, correct society, you only find things that don't hurt people's feelings. So today's shiur is not just going to be about what, just, what, what I just talked about. That was just an intro. But it's really going to be about something that's a much more difficult topic that is unspoken of in the English language. I only found this out when I looked for it myself. It's called wasting seed. There's obviously other topics we'll throw in as well. But wasting seed, if you notice, anyone that watches Hebrew lectures online, the sea of them. A few really strong rabbis have told the people the truth, whether it's from the Zohar, Sifrei Chachamim, Gemara, Torah Bichtav, many, many sources, which we'll go over many of them. In the English language, sadly, I became the third person to speak about it publicly just a few months ago. There's the shiur that I made, which is about an hour shiur or so, a few months ago. Baruch Hashem, very, very popular. I think it's my top shiur. There's Rabbi Alona Nava that made a, a few small clips about it, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and some others a little longer. And then there's Rabbi Mizrahi, who's been telling the truth for the last 22 years, also has a few clips about it, and he also has a shiur out there that's about it. The fact that I've only been giving lectures for the last couple of years and I became the third one out of thousands of rabbis that speak the English language is sad. Why? Because according to Chazal, there's no sin greater. Obviously there's Shabbat, but aside from that, there's no sin greater than Zerah Levatala. There's no sin greater than wasting seed. Chazal says, and we'll go over it with some sources, it's the equivalent of idol worship, including incest, including Chilul Hashem, and a few other small ones, all together in one package. It's a nice package deal. 
Most people don't know this. Every teenager has this problem. Every guy that's in his 20s has this problem. In the 30s, many do. And this sin continues for generation after generation. And even sometimes people that are married who don't know how to conduct themselves with the Torah life also are in the same problem. So we're going to talk about this and I'm going to provide you some sources. But the first thing I'd like to provide you is a reason of why rabbis don't talk about it from the Torah. Because Hashem obviously in His infinite wisdom wanted to give us information that's eternal. As it says in the Gemara Masechet um, Megillah, although there are over 1.2 million prophets throughout history, at least 1.2 million prophets throughout history, only 55 are mentioned in the, in the Tanakh. 40, 48 males, 7 females. So we ask Hashem, why? Why only 55? What, the Torah of the 1.2 million wasn't good enough? What happened to them? What happened to their prophecies? Maybe we want to see it. Answer, the prophecies of the 1.2 million, or the majority of them, was only relevant to their generation. Kalvachomel, we mean, we understand from here that the 55 we do have, the information is relevant for eternity. No one can say that just because Moses didn't have a car, that's the reason why he didn't drive on Shabbat. He didn't drive on Shabbat because it's not allowed. It's not allowed today. It wasn't allowed back then. It's never going to be allowed. So uh, the conservative and the reforms and the fake religious that drive to Beknesset on Shabbat thinking they're doing a mitzvah should know this is a very, very big mistake. You're better off staying home, never, never going to a synagogue one day in your life than turning on the car for half a second. I actually ha have one of my students, he's in the car business, and he sent me, uh, he knows he's an engineer, and he sent me a uh, very complex spreadsheet showing how many actual fires are being ignited every time you just press the gas, based on the RPMs of the car, based on how fast you're driving, and so on. The minimum... The minimum, the highest is tens of thousands. But the minimum, the first number that I see is 3,000, just by pressing the gas. Combustion. Yeah. This is a problem. So one time you press the gas, you lit 3,000 fires. Which, by the way, is 3,000 sins. It's 3,000 separate sins. It's not one sin. It's 3,000 separate sins. You press the brake, press the gas, somebody goes to Biknesset, they made 1.5 million... Averot, which is a little bit of a problem to show up to Olam Abba with, with that kind of uh, account. Because the Olam Abba, there's two of them. There's the good one and not so good. Jeremiah told us some information that can help us today. Jeremiah tried, like all prophets, his main job of a prophet is to do kiruv. To bring the nation back to Hashem. To wake them up and to tell them the full story. Tell them the truth. Whether they do it or not is irrelevant. I'm going to tell you the truth today. Whether you listen or not is your choice. But at least you'll have a choice based on information. At least it's going to be an educated decision. Whether you sin, you don't sin, it's not my problem. But at least you'll know. And that's the one thing that someone took away from me. Many people took away from me before I did tshuva. They never told me. I can't tell you that I would have listened to them. I was in a different world. I had millions and millions of dollars. I had a company to run. My gava was a little bit higher than earth. I can't tell you that I would have listened. But, it's still a 50-50 shot. No one can tell me that I definitely wouldn't have. And I know myself that maybe I would. Maybe I wouldn't. Either way, it's always a 50-50 shot, which means it's never your job. It's never your job to decide for people. And there's a Gemara, there's a Divrei Chazal that says that um, if you know that someone is not going to listen, it's better not to tell them because at least their sin is shogeg. Shogeg. 
No big deal. You know, it's the accidental sin. This is a problem. This is a misunderstanding. Why? Because they also miss the Mishnah, which precedes it. It's before. It's the beginning of the oral Torah. In Perkei Avot, everyone knows Perkei Avot, no? You know Perkei Avot? It says that a sin that's accidental, a shogeg, that comes from lack of learning, turns into mezid, turns into purpose. So you didn't know. Fine, you didn't know. You don't have to know. But you have to learn. You are commanded to learn. Now, if you didn't know because you didn't want to learn, then your sin is not shogeg. It's mezid. It's on purpose. There's no such thing as I could just show up to Hashem ignorant. No such thing. So all of these people, whether they call themselves rabbis or they call themselves something else, that are telling people, no, 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 it's... This whole generation is anusim and it's uh, full of people that are miskenim and they don't know and they're this and they're that. It's nonsense. According to Hashem's information, it's 100% nonsense. You don't have to take my word for it. You can see it from the Torah itself. You learn it, you're going to see it. And Be'ezot Hashem will learn today. Refaini Adonai ve'arafet Oshaini ve'avashia Heal me, Hashem, and I will be healed. Save me, Hashem, and I will be saved, for you are my praise. Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 14. What is Jeremiah telling us here? The background story of why Jeremiah is crying to Hashem is because Jeremiah tried to do Kiruv. But Kiruv the right way. He told the people the truth. He found the tribe of Ephraim wasting seed. Bunch of Rashaim wasting seed. And he rebuked them. He told them this is the worst thing on earth. You're crazy. Shem said this is guaranteed Gehenom. This is Abu Dazarah. This is horrendous. This is going to kill you in this world and the next. They went against him. They went against him and tortured him. He says, Hashem, heal me. They're torturing me. For what? I'm trying to do your work. I'm trying to tell the people the truth. This is what I get. These people are going against me. I'm trying to help them and they're going against me. Just like people that watch some of my shiurim, they go against me also. Just like they've been doing it for Rav Mizrahi for 22 years or anyone that speaks the truth. They go against you. I have some people that actually take clips of my videos and they write different descriptions. No, this is what he says. It's actually, if you watch the video, it's very good clips. It's the truth. They just want to translate it something way, a different way. I actually use some of their clips for myself when I publicize them. It's good clips. You don't want to believe it? It's your choice. It's not my problem. I'm not making up anything. Everything comes from the Torah. If it's, my, if it's my opinion, I tell you, it's my opinion. It's obvious it's my opinion. So Jeremiah did the same thing, but obviously, if I could be his nail, I would be happy. But nonetheless, they're torturing him. How much are they torturing him? If we fast forward to chapter 20. Chapter 20, verse 14. Cursed be the day on which I was born. May the day on which my mother bore me not blessed. Jeremiah gets to the point where he curses the day he was born. Shem How could someone so holy, so pure, so amazing, get to a point of cursing the day that he was born? The Midrash that was actually written by his son, Ben Sira, say that this was the day 
that the tribe of Ephraim didn't just go against Jeremiah, but they told him, you have two choices. They surrounded him, overpowered him. So you have two choices. You either waste seed just like us, right now, or you're going to see a real live Sodom and Gomorrah. And what they did in Sodom and Gomorrah, the same thing they did in Tel Aviv just a few days ago with the gay parade. They threatened to, they threatened to rape him. So after forcing him to waste seed, he was really considered anus. He cursed the day that he was born. Why is it so bad? Why does Hashem care so much? We waste seed. In last week's parasha, Hashem gave us a little bit of a secret. There was a nice chidush I got that I think you'd like. After telling us each level of punishment, we have five levels of punishment. It starts from losing our money. And Hashem Elachem, the last level, says that as it happened in Bet HaMikdash, we're going to get to such tar- starvation, Hashem Elachem, we'd have to eat our children. That's what happened in Bet HaMikdash. He wasn't kidding. But if you notice, before each section, each section of punishment, Hashem says the same thing. Translation. If despite these, meaning despite the punishment that I gave you in a previous level, you will not be chastised towards me, meaning you still don't have Yirat Shamayim, you still don't care. You're still sinning. And you behave casually with me. Then I too will behave towards you with casualness. Now the pshat of casualness, according to Chazal, so we pick and choose whichever mitzvot we want to keep. Kosher? Yeah, you know what? I live in Brooklyn. There's a kosher place in every corner. It's not that hard to keep kosher. You have to mamash not want to eat kosher to eat non-kosher in Brooklyn. In different places around the world maybe a little more difficult, but in today's world it's pretty easy to eat kosher. Anyone with an ounce of them well, knows that Hashem pays for it anyway. But Shabbat, eh, not so sure. I'll keep half a Shabbat. Hashem should be happy I kept half a Shabbat. Wasting seed. Nah, that's not for me. That's for people that are machmirim. That's uh, tzaddikim. I'm not at that level. Watching my eyes? Eh, that's for uh, Rav Vadia, Rav Steinman. Yeah, Gdole Adol. They watch their eyes. Not for me. You know, you pick and choose. Netilat Yadayim? Yeah, that's, that's, I can do that. Netilat Yadayim. I can do Netilat Yadayim. Even when I get out of the bathroom, I do Netilat Yadayim. And you pick and choose. Shem says, you treat me with casualness. You make a joke of my Torah. You think it's a choice to keep all the mitzvot. For that, it's a separate punishment. Violating my, my, my Torah is one punishment. Treating it with casualness is a completely separate punishment. But now, what's the chidush? He kept saying, V'alachtem eimi keri. Keri, for anyone that's learned a little bit of Gemara, also knows that it has another meaning. If we go to Sefer Devarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 10, Ki tetze איש אשר לא יהיה טהור מקרה לילה ויצא אל מחוץ למחנה לא יבוא אל תוך המחנה והיה לפנות ערב ירחץ במים וכבוא השמש יבוא אל תוך המחנה. When a camp goes out against your enemies you shall guard against anything evil. If there will be among you a man who will not be clean because of nocturnal, 
occurrence. He shall go outside the camp. He shall not enter the midst of the camp. When it will be toward evening, he shall immerse himself in the water, meaning going to the mikveh. And when the sun sets, he may enter the midst of the camp. So a nocturnal occurrence, meaning a seminal emission, is also called keri, bal keri, someone that has a waste seed, but unintentionally. In street language, they call it having a wet dream. And the Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara talks about this verse, page 20b. Tanu Rabbanan, the rabbi is taught in the Bereta. V'nishmarta mikol davara, which is this verse we just talked about, which meant, and you shall beware of anything evil. Shelo yaher adam bayom, v'yavoli de tum'a balayla. This teaches that a person should not think immoral thoughts by day, and come thereby to tum'a at night. When the Gemara is mentioning the vara, evil, it's not talking about, think about bad things happening in the world, maybe there's going to be a war, maybe I'm going to lose all my money in the stock market, maybe my wife's cheating on me or is going to leave me, maybe my husband hates me, maybe my kids are going to fail at school. No, no, no. They're not talking about the vara like that. The vara, Chazal says in the Gemara, it's talking about thinking about something erotic, inappropriate. Why? Because he didn't watch his eyes. When he didn't watch his eyes, of course he's going to think of something erotic at night. So much so, that the Shulchan Aruch says, or the Mepharshim on the Shulchan Aruch say, better said, if someone has a ba- you know, an erotic dream, even if the woman in his dream is his wife, he wakes up out of the dream and he wants to be with his wife. Alakha, not allowed. Until he cools down and he doesn't have those thoughts anymore, then he could do what he wants, then he's a normal person again. Why? Because if he commits relations with his wife at that moment that he's still hot from the dream, Shem what can happen to the child? The child can have partial control by Shadim, by demons. Why? Because they contributed to making the child. Which, by the way, just so you know, according to Chazal, every single woman you see in your dreams, including if she looks like your wife, is actually none, no, no one less than the Satan's wife herself. That's her job. Our job is to take your seed and create a bunch of soldiers to torture you in this world and the next. So when you give her that seed, you're creating an enemy for yourself. This is kind of scary. It's just the beginning. Can I ask you a question? In your dream, doesn't your, um, your soul actually leave your body in your sleep? Your Not all of it. If your entire soul left your body, you would die. It's only most of the soul. There's still a uh, still a part of your soul stays with you, and um, part of the soul goes up to Shemaim and gets the news of what is the outcome for tomorrow. Meaning that you go up there and you tell the betin of Shemaim, "What did I do today?" And they'll tell you, "Okay, based on these deeds, tomorrow you're gonna have a very difficult day." So that's why you see sometimes people wake up, Tisha B'Av, nothing happened, but they're already in a bad mood. They woke up, they see their wife, she's happy. Hey, how are you? Good morning, honey. How you doing? Ah, don't talk to me. What did you do? What did I do? You're already in a bad mood. Why? Because you got bad news from Shemaim and your soul knows it. You don't know it consciously, but subconsciously you know it. You know you're going to have a tough day. So now when someone is having these dreams, it's their fault. There's no such thing as having these dreams just because. It's because you saw something. Either during that day or during your life. But in general, it's usually during a recent time. According to Gemara, Masechet Brachot, 
Most dreams are complete nonsense. They have zero meaning. Once in a blue moon, someone can have a dream that could actually be a partial prophecy. But the ones that are nonsense, what's the nonsense? What does it mean, nonsense? What's shtuyot? It's a combination of the things you saw. You saw an elephant today, so you're going to see a woman with an elephant head. You saw a, uh, somebody running, you're going to see I don't know, a little bunny running. You're going to see all types of strange things in a dream. They don't really make sense, but it's a combination of all the things you actually saw in your real life. If you looked at a putza, you looked at an immodest woman, that's what you're going to see. And sometimes you'll see her that you saw on the street, and sometimes the satan will actually, or the satan's wife will actually have your wife's face. So you're going to think, oh, you know what, I'm not making a sense, my own wife. It's not your wife. What happens at that point is Shem is even if you waste the seed, it's already a big problem. Even if you get out of the dream, you survive the dream, you didn't waste seed. You're lucky, you see your wife right next to you. And your wife loves you and she wants to hug you. She has no clue what dream you had. Not allowed to touch her. Not allowed to touch her. Why? Because according to Ari Kadosh, which we know most of the secrets part of the Torah because of him, he says that all of the crazy people, you know, people who have mental problems, are usually controlled by Shadim. They're usually controlled by demons. And that's why you see a lot of them say they see things, they hear things. They do. They're not imagining it. They do. They do see things. They do hear things. You can't see it because you're normal. But they do. Sometimes it's the fault of the parents. Sometimes it's a gilgul. Now why does Hashem care so much about this keri? He tells us here that on one end in this parasha when he says, me keri on one end means treating me with casualness. Right? means with casualness. But on another end it says, not only did you sin, but you're still wasting seed. Okay, you didn't do the tzedakah daim. Fine, I got it. You didn't do bracha. You stole from me the food you ate. You didn't do bracha. You stole from Hashem. Anyone that enjoys anything in this world without saying a bracha, Chazal says they stole from Hashem. Have to do a bracha. You didn't do bracha. Fine. You violated Shabbat, Hashem Yerachem. You worshipped an idol, Hashem Yerachem. You did all those things. Okay, you're going to get your punishment for it. Fine. But not only did you do that, you still have the audacity to waste seed? Meaning it's at a different level. It's a different level. It's a different world. Now, just so far, we've been talking for a little while. Hopefully we record it. So far, a few new insights. But the reality of it is that just this information that we talked about is not public information. Because the will become public. Just this is already enough to know that it's a big deal to waste seed. We got the hint so far. Why is it such a big deal? The holy books tell us that Hashem made the Torah a part of Him. Meaning that every letter in the Hebrew alphabet that's in the Torah, which is 22 letters, is actually Shem Hashem. It's actually the name of Hashem. Each letter is a name of Hashem. When you read the Torah, that's the reason why each letter is considered a mitzvah. But then Chazal adds to it. He says, it's not only Hashem and the Torah one, but the Jewish nation is also part of him. How do we see this? You spell the word Yehudi, Jew, in Hebrew. It's Yud, Hey, Vav, Dalet, Yud. Right? But if you take, you see the Dalet... Looks like a resh. It also looks like half of the hay. If you take the last yud, 
and you put it under the Dalit, it looks very, very similar to Hashem's name. Yud, Hey, Vav, and Hey. I drew it. I'm not exactly the best artist, but I drew it before the Shior, and you can see the point. Hashem put His name inside you. What's another source? Scientific source. In 1983, Dr. Rubenstein arrived to Israel, I believe from, from uh, Venezuela, and worked for the University in Molecular, uh, Molecular Biology. But his main job was to investigate the DNA. DNA of different species, DNA of sharks, DNA of monkeys, DNA of uh, rats, humans, and so on. In 1986, he made a major discovery. He saw that there's one major thing that's the same exact thing in a DNA of everything. Now, every DNA, in essence, looks similar whether it's a DNA of a shark or a DNA of a human being or a DNA of a uh, rat. They have the same basic foundation. Anyone that's ever seen a, uh, a visual of a DNA, it's these two squiggly lines with some lines across them. So we asked the computer, what happens if I take the two squiggly lines and I break them apart? There's two squiggly lines are tied together. What if I just separate them? And after enough analysis, the computer responds, the subject will explode. Meaning you cannot exist if there's only one, one line. It has to stay connected. Okay, so that means to stay connected is important. What's the next question, logically? What's keeping it connected? Computer answers... Every so often, meaning every several acids, ACTG it's called, there is a bridge connecting the two lines. Thank you. There's a bridge connecting the two lines, the two squiggly lines, made of sulfur. Sulfur. Go to Yamamelach, go to Dead Sea, bunch of sulfur over there. Same type of chemical. Okay, fine. Bridges is important. We can't break the bridge. But there's another question here. The computer said every so often. Is there some type of... Is it random? Or is there a design? Where there's an actual calculation. There's, it's not every so often. There's an actual method here. The computer says yes. Every DNA has the same bridge. and has the same calculation. And the calculation is, is every tenth acid... And after that, it's every fifth acid. And after that, it's every sixth. And then five. Ten, five, six, five. Ten, five, six, five. Anyone that knows Gimatria knows that ten is Yud, five is He, six is Vav, and five again is He. Yud, He, Vav, and He. Hashem's name is written inside your DNA. When you waste seed... This is the reason why people have emunah problems. So Chazal is telling us many, many things about wasting seed. And these are some of the things that people need to understand. Rabbi Nachman from Breslev says, when someone wastes seed, It's very easy for them to become an idol worshiper. Very easy for them to not only lose their emunah, but completely become a complete heretic. Reason? They're destroying both their physical and spiritual brain. Spiritual brain, we could understand what it means. But physical... It's hard to understand. You need to know science. So just so you know, part of the 
seed that comes out, the semen that comes out of your body, part of it comes from your brain. Now, there was a book that's not very popular. It was written about 120, 190 years ago by a doctor that was also a rabbi in Germany named Rav Avram Sterner, Stern from Berlin. The book is called Mazor u Trufa. 60 pa- 64 Dapim, 60, which is 128 pages in today's world. And he did scientific research, medical research, not just his own, but many, many doctors about wasting seed and whether it helps you, like psychologists foolishly say today, or it destroys you. And he has case after case after case after case of all the diseases that wasting seed leads to. Now he also starts the book, which is very scary by the way, I'll give you some examples in a little bit, but he also says in the book, uses a Rambam, says that the seed of a male is the tamtzit, which is in essence the, um, what's tamtzit in English? Like the, uh, the thing that you make the juice from. What is it called? Like, no, not the pulp. Like, you know, artificial juice. The, um, the liquid. Yeah, the flavoring in essence. It's the foundation, the concentrate, the foundation of the juice. Like, for example, the Coca-Cola. Yeah, the syrup, exactly. It's the foundation. You can't make the juice. You know, it has the, it's the foundation of it. It says that the seed is the foundation of the entire male body. And Rambam says that the only reason why Hashem created us with a body is for us to be able to use our seed for pool bu. For us to be able to bring children to the world. Otherwise, there's no purpose for our body. Otherwise, we just remain souls. Which, in essence, the foundational reason of why we exist as human beings with a body is for the seed, is to use the seed. But not to use the seed and waste it, but to use it to bring children to the world. How do we know? When a woman gets pregnant, she has a child, like this cute one in the back, and after... She gives birth, many women choose to breastfeed. Maybe men don't know this, but during the time, at least not the, you know, the single ones, during the time that a woman breastfeeds, the woman doesn't, usually does not have, most of the time does not have a period. So if she breastfeeds for a year or two years, she doesn't have a period for a year or two years. This is in the vast majority of cases. Why? Why? Because the milk is actually blood. It used to be blood. Everything you eat, whether it's an orange, or it's a steak, or it's a candy, everything, some part of it turns into blood. The other part of it that's not turned into blood goes out of your body. This very same blood is what you used to live. For a woman, it's what turns into milk. For breastfeeding. Now why is it if you take a liter of breast milk out of a woman, in many cases she actually feels better, not worse. She feels better. It's a relief. But chas v'shalom, you take a liter of blood out of her body, she may not survive. If the two things are the same, How could this be? Because the breast milk also has a few other things that were added to the body, added to the blood, to make a breast milk. But the Rambam says, and actually in uh, Rav Steren says, the seed of a male is even superior to blood. 
just like the blood is the basic syrup for the milk, you can't have one, you know, you can't have the milk without the blood, you can't have the blood without the seed for a male. The seed of a male is superior to his blood. It's the foundation of his entire body. Which means that when he wastes it, he's slowly killing himself. And this is why the rest of his book is dedicated to subjects, one after another, real-life subjects, not only from him, but from many, many doctors that show exactly what happens to anywhere from teenagers at the age of 15, one teenager that was 15 years old, wasted seed for eight years, and slowly but surely killed himself. But he didn't just kill himself one day, he just appeared and died. He said hello, and the next thing he died, he didn't get a heart attack. But his body slowly deteriorated, became much, much weaker, all the way to the point of starting to bleed in strange places. His hand turned into rubber, very rubbery, very weak. His bones started disintegrating. There was strange, awful smelling liquid coming out of his spine, which is another part of where the seed travels through. Until he died. This is just the first subject. The best case scenario. The other ones got much worse. One of the other patients, as we, told, as we said, the seed comes from the brain. So slowly but surely it's destroying the brain. One of the other subjects, you could noticeably see that the veins on his brain are becoming coming out of his head. And you can see this today in some people. One day they look healthy, you don't see them for five, six years, and all of a sudden, the guy looks a little weird. A little bit like a mutant. So much so, the Chazal says, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, not Chazal, the best doctors in the world at that time said that of a thousand people that die, one dies from natural causes, and the other 999 die from overusing their seed. That's how much. But where do we have proof of this in the Torah? Does anybody know who the smartest man of all time was? Shlomo Melech. Shlomo Melech. Listen, it's a recent smart guy. He's a Jew too. So Shlomo Melech gave us some insight. As soon as I find it. Shlomo Melech was gifted wisdom beyond any man that ever lived before or after. So he knew what he was doing. He was also very rich. He was also married to a thousand women. And he gave us a little bit of insight. In Proverbs 31, verse 3, it says, Al titen la nashim chelecha, Give not your strength to women and let your conduct not destroy the protocol of kings. Here Chazal explained to us, he says, do not give your strength to women. What's your strength? What's your koach? <coughs> your koach is your seed. The entire strength of a man is from his sperm. This is why also the athletes like to inject testosterone into their body. So they can become stronger. Or when you have an uh, ill patient, a 
that's suffering some serious disease, sometimes they'll put steroids in them. But Shlomo Melech is telling you that if you give all of your strength to this tava, to this desire of women, to this desire of wasting your seed, You're going to destroy yourself. But if you need a little bit more details, he said it in another place also. In uh, also Proverbs 25, verse 16. Dvashmatsata echol Translation, when you find honey, eat what is sufficient for you lest you be satiated and vomited up. Chazal says that dvash, honey, is really refer- referring to women, isha. Why isha? It has the same numerical value. Isha has numerical value, the uh, gematria of 306, and so does dvash. So when you find a woman... Be a normal person. If you spend all of your seed every other day to a new woman, or perhaps do it even without a woman, he's telling you something here. He's not telling you about dvash. He's not telling you. You don't need Shlomo Amalek to tell you not, don't eat too much uh, honey because eventually you're going to throw up. That's not exactly wisdom of the smartest man of all time. He's telling you something here. If you find honey, if you find a woman, take it easy. Don't... Have, just have just enough. Why? Because if you have too much, you're eventually going to vomit. What does it mean you're eventually going to vomit? You're going to eventually not be able to handle it. It's going to destroy your life to such an extent that even after you married someone and became a normal person, you don't have a new girl every other day, you're going to suffer in your marriage too. Your wife... Is a normal person. She's not like you and like what you used to be. You have to be able to control yourself. But not only that. Sometimes you see that there's shlom bite issues. Sometimes it's a religious couple. Sometimes it's a non-religious couple. You see, you know, you see. They both seem normal. They both seem rational. But the wife is always angry at the husband. Later on, many times you find out that the husband wastes seed on his own. Not with another woman, chas v'shalom, but on his own. Why is the wife angry? Because even though she herself doesn't know, her neshama does know. Her neshama does know that he's giving his seed to another woman. Specifically, the Satan's wife. The Shema is not very happy with you. It's a problem. In the Gemara Masechet Sukkah, page 42b, Rabbi Yochanan says, Ever katan yesh le adam, mariv o savea, masbio raev. Rabbi Yochanan says, A man has a small organ. The one that starves it is satiated, meaning he's full. And the one that feeds it stays hungry. It's supposed to be the opposite. If you feed it, it's supposed to be satiated, full. If you starve it, it's supposed to be hungry. Chazal says, no. Someone says, no, listen. I'm not going to be like I used to be when I was a teenager doing it three times a day. Five times a day. No, no. No, just once in a while. I'll do it once a week. Chazal says it's impossible. A man has a small organ. If he feeds it, meaning he wastes seed, it'll never be full. If he starves it, it'll be full. 
Meaning, you won't need to. You won't feel the desire anymore, eventually. Eventually, when he stops, after the Yetzirah gets weaker and weaker, you won't have the desire anymore. Obviously, with his wife, but as far as wasting it and making the toilet another wife, it's not going to happen anymore. This is what Chazal tells you. So much so that they had to repeat it again. In Masechet Sanhedrin. So the same thing again. Ever katan yesh la adam, marivo savea mas biorev. Man has a small organ, the one that starves it is satiated, the ones that <coughs> feed it is hungry forever. So why would they repeat it? What, the Gemara has nothing else to do with their life? No. In Masechet Sanhedrin, page 104a, Chazal says it's alacha. Meaning, it cannot change. Ever. Alacha is eternal. Can't change. Anything that's added today is building on the existing alachot. You can never change an alacha. Because alacha comes from Moshe from Al Sinai. This is a law of nature. There's no such thing as doing it once in a while. You feed the organ, it'll never stop. And slowly but surely, a man is wasting his power and killing himself. Now what else does Chazal say about this? The Gemara also says that each time a man makes a mitzvah, this is actually also in the uh, Mishnah. Each time a, a man makes a mitzvah, he buys himself a defending attorney. Creates himself an angel that's going to help him in this world and the next. That's why mitzvah, goeret mitzvah. One mitzvah leads to another. You have one mitzvah, all of a sudden you have a little bit more power and you feel like doing another mitzvah. Person makes an avera, makes a sin, creates a demon. His own personal demon. Demon gives power more to the, to the world of Tuma. What does the world of Tuma do? Influences the person to make more sins. That's why it says also, Avera goeret Avera. One sin leads to another. This is why, Shemerchem, sometimes you see somebody that was from a month ago, made one small sin, went with some girl, and he's not married. Violated Shabbat. Smoked a cigarette on Shabbat. Not, uh, okay, it's not, you didn't drive, you smoked a cigarette. A month later, the guy is eating bacon on Yom Kippur. Why? Avera goret avera. One sin, influenced to another sin. Another sin, another sin, another sin. Next thing you know, he's a complete idol worshiper. But it's due to his own actions. It's not due to anybody else. Each time a person creates this sin, he creates also a klipa. He creates a shell around him, which makes it very, very difficult for him to listen to Torah. Makes it very, very difficult for him to read Torah. Why? Because Torah is pure. It's the purpose of this world. Without Torah, there's no purpose of this world. Gemara Masechet Avodah Zarah says, the angels were very, very scared at Mount Sinai, before Am Yisrael showed up. Why? Why would you be scared? It's the ultimate day of, uh, of the world. Gemara says because all of the other nations rejected the Torah. And they knew that if Am Yisrael rejects the Torah, Hashem will bring back the world to Tov Avo. Brings the back of the world to nothing. The same thing that it was before we created it. So now each time someone wants to learn this holy Torah and bring purity into his life, but he has a shell surrounding him. The shell is blocking it, which is the reason, for example, when I first started doing tshuva, 
went to Shur Torah with a very famous Rav, a very big Chacham. I would wait for this Shur the whole week. Usually I don't really sleep much at night. So, being awake was never really a problem for me. I go to the shiul after work, all alert, excited, pumped up to hear something new, work my brain muscles, <coughs> use the Hebrew language for the first time in 15 or 20 years. Five minutes into it, snoring. Out. Can't survive five minutes. Okay, I so, said, okay, this happened once. Next week I'll do better. Maybe I really was tired and I didn't know. A week later, five minutes, three seconds. Nothing changed. This is getting upsetting. I wait the whole week. I wanted to shoot. Next week, got to six minutes. Next week, ten minutes. I could still never stay to an hour, hour and a half shoot. Can't survive. Sometimes somebody... Can't survive, they fall asleep. Sometimes they can't sit. They have to go somewhere. They have to smoke a cigarette. They have to go call their friends. They have to do something. They can't listen to Torah. Why? Because the shell, the klipa, is so thick that when the purity is trying to go through, you're spending all of the energy you have left just to get it in. By the time it finally a little bit got in, you're completely tired, you fall asleep. But with enough training, with enough effort, you start peeling off the klipa. You start peeling off the shell. Eventually it becomes 15 minutes, half hour, an hour. Eventually, Bezat Hashem, one day you could speak for five hours about it. it. Takes time, takes effort. You can't give up. This is one of the main things that people need to understand is that there's always tshuva. As long as you're alive, there's tshuva. As long as the light still works, there's tshuva. Even in the uh, uh, Mishnah, Avot, that says that the one that causes other people to sin has a much bigger difficulty doing tshuva, even his gate, even his ability to do tshuva is still possible. It just doesn't have as much siyat dishmaya, doesn't have as much help from shamayim. Normal person does tshuva in his 20s, can have 90% help from Hashem, 90% siyat Ishmael. Someone that's in the same age but has a whole website against rabbis, he wants to do tshuva, he may have 10%. Same age, same situation, same school, same look, same everything else. He went against rabbis, went against the Torah, was a heretic publicly, machtia rabim, can have less siyat Ishmael. But he can still do tshuva. You have a question. Hmm? You can always do tshuva as long as you're alive and the source is Menashe. Menashe was a Rasha Merusha that even killed his own grandfather Isaiah, the prophet. He cut him into pieces, chopped him up. Chopped up his own grandfather, the prophet. Kadosh. Not only that, there wasn't enough. He erased the name of Hashem everywhere he can find. Anywhere he saw Hashem's name, he erases it. Wasn't enough. Put idol worship everywhere. Not enough. Raped his own sister. Incest. Zerah When he was ready to do tshuva, Hashem accepted him. This we find out from Masechet uh, Sanhedrin 107b. So now you know that Shuvah is available. But as we started this year, although some of the things you may have heard were scary, it's not scary enough.
when Hashem created men, we started sinning, sinning pretty quickly. Eventually, you fast forward to the generation of Noah, and the average person was a Rasha Meusha. Chazal says that the major sin, even though the last straw was stealing, the major sin of the generation was wasting seed. Which is the reason that after the Mabul, after the flood, Hashem gave Noah seven laws. First six he gave to Adam Arishon, he added one to Noah. Which is the reason why it's called Sheva Mitzvah B'nei Noach, because he was the last one to get it, so it's named after him. One of these laws is do not spill blood. Most of us understand it as do not murder. That's the pshat. Wasting seed is also murder. According to scientists, each and every single seed, each one, as all of the things you need to make a human being. Obviously, when they connect with an egg. The woman's egg. Not an egg and chicken egg. <laughs> I have to make you laugh a little bit to get you out. Don't want you to get too depressed. I hear this stuff, I almost want to cry. Because I know so many people are in this zevel, in this garbage. They have no idea that they're in garbage. You know, a rat doesn't know that he's eating garbage. He thinks it's Gan Eden. He thinks it's a, it's a hotel, five-star hotel. Why? Because he's part of the garbage. When you're part of the garbage, you don't know that it's garbage. Only when you leave the garbage for a little while, you're like, what's going on? I don't know. It's garbage. So many people are in this garbage. I was too. It wasn't different. Now most of us understand do not spill blood as do not murder. But scientists is telling us that each and every seed is technically has all the things that we need to make a human being. Each and every single one of them is a potential soul that's supposed to come to the world. If this seed has a problem with it, it may either not become a soul or it can become a problematic person. Someone that's born with diseases, chas v'shalom. There's, there's more than enough diseases in the world that we know that disease exists. The word machala, which is disease, has the numerical value of 83. That's in the Gemara, Bava Metzi, I think. What's the significance of 83? Hashem says there's 83 different types of diseases that he brought on Mitzrayim. But Chazal is also telling us something else. Not only is each seed a potential soul, but eventually you're going to learn that you're going to see that it, how much of murder it really is to waste one seed. You fast forward to recent generation and scientists said that each time seed comes out of the human body, it's approximately 300 million seeds. Which means that each time you waste seed, you're murdering approximately 300 million people. You're murdering America each time. You're destroying a country each time. Murdering, murdering one person, ah, it's no big deal, it's just one guy. Still, 299 million, 999,999. It's not a big deal. You murder the whole 300, it starts becoming a big deal. You do it three times a day, you murdered India. You do it five, you got to China. By the end of the week, you murdered an entire world. Show up to Allah Abba like that. Show up to the bed of Shamaim. Each week I murdered the world. Good luck. Oh, by Kev Shabbat. Good for you. We'll turn off the uh, fire and gain on Shabbat for you. 
That's what happens. Shomer Shabbat, good for you. We'll turn off the fire on Shabbat. Or Chaim HaKadosh heard one time that there's a gzera, there's a decree from Shemaim that there's a decree from Shemaim on Am Yisrael, so he went into the Galut, he went into exile, place that even though he was Gdol Ador, no one knew him. He arrives at this place where the Rav over there is a holy Rav, it's a holy Rabbi, that gets secrets from Shemaim every so often. Gets secrets from Shemaim. So now everyone sees Chaim ben Atar, or Chaim, Regular guy. Maybe even less. They don't know he's Gdol Adol. Thursday night, the Rav says to the Drasha, I had a dream. And in my dream, they told me on this parashat Bechukotai, the first verse, Im Bechukotai Telechu, I got 14 translations of the first verse that were translated <coughs> by Chaim ben Atar, HaKadosh, HaTzadik, HaGadol, HaYafeh, all these different types of embellishments and compliments that he's giving all oh, Chaim. Everyone's excited, yeah, oh Chaim, yeah, Chaim ben Atar, wow. You know, back then they respected rabbis. Oh, Baruch Hashem, see, Satan already started. I hope this thing wasn't off for that long. See, you see, you see it live. You see it live. The Satan hates my lectures. So he kills the uh, batteries very quickly. It's supposed to last two hours. Sometimes it lasts five minutes. But it's good. It's good news. If the, sun, if the Satan is spending his time on us, that means we're learning something useful. So now, everyone's excited about Or oh, Chaim. And then this old man says, No, nah, he's not a tzaddik, he's not a kadosh, what are you... Uh, I know him, he's not really a big deal. Like, oh, how dare you go against the Rav, he's Gdol Ador. The rabbi of the Keilah quiets everyone down, he says, Okay, 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 let me give you the Pirushim. Ignore this guy. Friday night comes after tefillah. The Rav says, I had another dream. They gave me 14 more translations of the same verse, and now we have 28. It's the same verse of this parasha, parashat bechukotai, that Or Chaim, Chaim ben Atar, HaKadosh, HaTzadik, HaGadol, HaMalach, and all these compliments that he's given him. Everybody's excited. Yeah, no more Pirushim. Wow. This is 300 years ago, so they were excited about Hidushim. And then this guy in the back again, he goes, Ah, stop it with the Tzaddik and the Kadosh. He's just Chaim. Chaimke. Chaimke. He's just a Chaim. Everybody gets angry at him. They want to beat him up. Hey, you're going against the Ravs. You're embarrassing the Ravs. Get out of here already. The Rav of the Kila says, calm down, calm down. Let me give you the Chidushim. Saturday afternoon, after Tefillah, the Rav says, I have a Chidush. I got in Shemaim again. 14 more translations of this Pasuk in Parashat Bechukotai that were given to me from, the, from Shemaim that were translated by Or Chaim. HaKadosh, HaTzadik, HaGadol, and all these compliments. And everyone's excited again and again. This guy says, stop it with this Chaim. How many times do I have to tell you he's not a Kadosh? He's barely even a Talmud. <clears throat> this time, even the Rav couldn't take it. He said, throw him in the cell. You know, in those days they had a cell, a jail cell, right in the entrance of the Bekneset. For anyone that was, uh, went against the Rabbis, would be put into the cell right next to the entrance, so everyone can spit on them on the way in and on the way out for going against the Rav. 
It's not like today that it's uh, popular to go against the Rav. Back then, they respected the rabbis. Rabbis were holy. Someone goes against the rabbi, Shem Menachem. Not if it's a Rasha, a real rabbi. Baruch Hashem, we have many in today's world. There's a few wear costumes that are not, but the point is there's many good ones. Back then, they, they got the respect they deserve. Today, not so much. Today, there's fist fights with rabbis sometimes. So anyway, they throw him into the cell. Chaim ben Atal. Gdol Ador is in a cell. All of Shabbat. Right before Avdalah comes up, they want to do Avdalah, all of a sudden, the whole world starts shaking. There's thunder, there's lightning. Chazal says that the only reason why Hashem created thunder is to scare us. Only reason. There's no other purpose for it. It's to scare us. Why? Because when you're scared of a thunder, you're like, wow, well, if that's just one of your small things, you have to have a little bit of Yirat Shamayim. Wakes us up. Whole world starts shaking, the ground starts shaking, the lights go in, go out, scary stuff. All of a sudden, there's a... on the door. Everyone's very scared, they have no idea what's happening here. The Rav says, okay, I'll go open the door. He opens the door and he sees a giant demon. Black angel, full of fire and all the scary things you can imagine, times a thousand. Rob says, what are you doing here? He says, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know who I am? No. I'm the angel that's in charge of turning back the fire on at Gehenom after Shabbat. Because Hashem turns it off. On Shabbat and Gehenom for anyone that kept Shabbat. Anyone that didn't keep Shabbat doesn't go off. So the part that goes off, I'm the one that turns it back on after Shabbat. Okay, so what do you want from us? So they told me in Shemaim that I'm not allowed to turn it on until Ora Chaim, Chaim ben Atal, does Avdalah. And you have him in jail. You should be ashamed of yourself. The Rav immediately collapses, runs to Ora Chaim, begs him for forgiveness, crying, hysterical. I didn't know, Kvot Rav, because I know, I know you didn't know. That was the point. He didn't know that Hashem is going to send an angel. But that's Ora Chaim. You should listen to him. They didn't send angels for me. So Chaim says, in regards to Exodus, chapter three, verse eight, Or Chaim Shmot Per Gimel Pasuk Chet. Summarize this whole thing. He says that at the end of times. We're going to be different than the generation of Mitzrayim. In Mitzrayim, we knew that the best of us, the best of us, the small amount of us that actually survived Mitzrayim, because as we know, at least 80% of Am Yisrael were killed in Mitzrayim in the Makat HaChoshech, the darkness plague. Why? They didn't want to do tshuva, they didn't want the Torah, they wanted to stay in Mitzrayim. Hashem killed them. There's a Midrash in Me'am Lo'ed that says it was much higher than 80%. Instead of 1 out of 5, it was really 1 out of 500,000 that survived. I go into that a little bit more in a different shiur, but to save time, Or Chaim says that the ones that actually survived were in the 49th level of Tum'ah, the 49th level of impurity. If they would have reached level 50, Hashem would have destroyed the world. One more sin, that's it. But Oa Chaim says, the generation before the Mashiach will reach the level 50. And the only way that could save him is Avinu Sheba So I was thinking to myself, 
How much worse can we be from idol worshippers? I mean, that's what they did. They were idol worshippers. That's why when they got the Yamsuf, Hashem didn't want to split the ocean. The Malach of Mitzrayim, which his name is Mitzrayim, came to Hashem and says, well, why are you going to split the ocean for these Israelites and kill my, my nation, the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians? I know the Egyptians, my nation is worshipping idols of Dima Vodazara, but Ele of Dima Vodazara, the Ele of Dima Vodazara. They idol worship, and they idol worship. So why would you kill one over the other? So I'm thinking to myself, why would Hashem save us even if we get to level 50, is one question, but I guess that's His promise to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, so that's good, it's good news. But the bigger question is, how can we get worse than idol worship? Most Jews, Baruch Hashem, don't idol worship. Maybe money, but it's a form of idol worship, but it's not like a, uh, I don't know, maybe. But there's one reason. Baruch Hashem, I had this chidushin when I was in Jerusalem about a month ago. Torah in Jerusalem is a different Torah. There was three things that Am Yisrael kept. They kept their language, they kept their names, and they kept their clothing. They looked like Israelites. They still spoke Hebrew. They still kept their names of Yaakov and Avraham and Yitzchak and Moshe. You still knew it's an Israelite and not an Arab. And they looked like Jews. They looked like Israelites. They looked... They had certain clothing that was different from the Egyptians. So you could notice, this is an Israelite, this is an Egyptian. Idol worshippers, yes, but they kept three things. And according to Chazal, that's one of the main reasons of why Hashem saved them. So how will we worse? Think about it. Yaakov, it's not Yaakov anymore most of the time. It's usually Jackie. Or Steve, or Matthew, all types of American goyish names. It's a reality. We live in America, we all have different names. Before going back to my original name, your own, in the business world for 16 years, I was known as Ron. I took the first two letters out. Why? Because Americans don't know how to say your own. They'd make up every other name in the world. At one point, they even said urine. <laughs> yeah, this is the Bizayon I had to go through in college, in uh, high school. What can you do? Kaparat avonot. But most Jews don't have Jewish names a lot. You know, it's especially if they're not religious. So our generation now is not really keeping the name. Okay, fine. We don't keep the name. Language. The fact that I'm giving you a lecture for the last however long it's been in English already answers that. Most Jews in the world do not speak Hebrew. It's just a reality. Especially Sfat HaKodesh, the holy language. The one they speak in Israel between one and another is not exactly the holiest language. They took, they created new words. Some words they actually created, Dafka, the opposite of the holy language. That's how much the Zionists like religion. But what about Clothing. I know they didn't have black and white back then. You're not obligated to be black and white. You could just look like a normal human being. It's fine. But what we're not allowed to do is look like goyim. Meaning, there's a certain type of clothing that's just not allowed for Jews. Both for men and for women. One of the main reasons of why Hashem saved us it's not because of the men. We were terrible. It's the women. The women were tzaddikot. They kept their modesty. So now when you see, unfortunately, most women, Jews and non-Jews, walk around half naked in the world, they think that the less clothes they have, the more attractive it is. Hashem Elachem. This has already been a problem for a while. It just got much worse. If you just look one generation back, we didn't have as much of a problem. 
two generations ago, the problem didn't exist. I went to a government building to get my daughter a passport a few months ago in Florida. And they had old pictures of Florida, of maybe like the 1930s, of people on a beach. Goyim, not Jews. I don't think anyone was Jewish. Bunch of pictures. Regular people. Hair covered. Skirts. The neckline goes up to here. Covered up to here. They're more modest than the biggest rabbinite in the world, I think. This was average for Goyim, not just Jews. Today, women... It's too hot. It's too hot. That's the answer. So what, they survived it 5,700 years and now it just became too hot. It wasn't hot in Mitzrayim. It wasn't hot in Egypt. In a desert. So women, we already know we have, an, we have a problem. Where's the problem with men? <coughs> this is one of the things that I actually had a chidush also in Israel. I personally have always hated skinny pants on guys. I think it's an awful look. It's not modest, which, by the way, a man is always obligated to be modest himself. But that was as much as I had. I mention it here and there, especially when you see old Israeli guys that are in their 40s and 50s that are fat and, you know, wearing skinny pants. It just drives me crazy how anyone rationalizes this. Is. Most men in general in today's age are overweight. We're not exactly all Brad Pitt. I mean, we're, people are overweight. I'm not skinny. Far from it. It would be kind of odd if you listened to me to a lecture if I was wearing skinny pants. I think you'd focus more on the skinny pants than me. But that was as much as I had. But then in Israel, Hashem gave me a chidush. Young guy it was bothering me for a few days because I started seeing yeshiva kids. Yeshiva kids wearing it. Okay, the chiloni, the one that's secular, not keeping anything, wearing skinny pants. What does he know? He's, we're lucky he even has clothes on. His girl covered her, uh, her finger. So, yeah, Baruch Hashem, skinny pants is already a uh, machmil. <laughs> but the religious guy wearing skinny pants is a problem. It bothered me, bothered me. And then one day I see this young kid, probably no, long, no older than 20 years old, running in front of me, you know, passes me, and he has tzitziot swinging, and he's got skinny pants on, sweatpants, skinny pants thingy. And then I got it. And I made a picture. You can pass it around, whoever wants to pick it up. But someone else wore skinny pants before. And it wasn't our friends. Nazi Germany. That's who wore skinny pants. Exactly skinny pants. White on top. Very fitted and skinny and gross on the bottom. So I had a sure a lecture in Netanya. The last one I did, and I, that's when I had this chidush that day. And it was actually, your, you know, the day of independence. Oh no, the, uh, Yom HaShoah. You to, you know, mourn the six million of us that they killed, Rashaim, Erushaim, that they were, the uh, uh, Nazis. Killed six million of our brothers and sisters. And everyone says, oh, I feel bad. They killed my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my sister, my brother. And I look at the current generation, I said, you feel bad? Yeah, of course we feel bad. I know this one that had his father died and his grandfather died. Yeah, yeah. I said, so how come you look just like them? Why do you look just like them? Don't tell me you feel bad and you look just like them. So that's when officially skinny pants, in my mind, and I think it already well before it was in my mind, in any person that knows any an ounce of Torah is officially Livush Goim. It's officially not allowed. 
not because I did an halacha, but just because if you ask any rabbi with a spine, they'll tell you it's not allowed. Libush goyim. So it's not only not modest, our enemy of just the previous generation wore it. You want to keep wearing it? Be my guest. It's your life. I just think it's wrong in many ways. But isn't it more of a gay thing? Than... <laughs> Not every guy that wears skinny pants is gay, although it does hurt your, uh, your, um, your private area and it makes it very difficult for men to actually have children later on. It also creates problems for kids. I actually heard Rabbi uh, Wallerstein say this. Uh, that it, it creates problems for children in, uh, you know, middle school uh, because their parents, their genius parents, are giving, you know, seven, eight-year-old kids skinny pants because they want them to look hip. And the kid ends up peeing in his pants every day because he says, so the teacher asks him, what, you should raise your hand well before you have to go to the bathroom. He says, no, no, I, I go well before I, I need to go. He goes, okay, so what's the problem? Why do you keep every day something? He says, no, it's, uh, I can't get the pants off. It's not the kid's fault. It's the moron that he has his parents. They want him to look hip. Destroying the kid from inside his house. Because we want to look like Goim. But that was the third part. That completed the puzzle. How do we get to Shah of Hamishim? How do we get to the third gate? We don't keep our language, we don't keep our names, and now we're not keeping our clothing because when our yeshiva boys want to look like goyim, we have ourselves a problem. Mashiach is around the corner, Bezat Hashem. So now you have many people complaining about their life, but if they just look at Parashat Noach, they'll understand a few things. When Hashem says you're not allowed to spill blood, He wasn't just referring to murder. After the flood and Hashem destroyed the world, Hashem gave the mitzvot to Noah. In chapter 9, verse 6, it says, ki b'tselem Elohim asa adam. Translation, whoever sheds the blood of a man, Dama Adam, within a man, his blood will be spilled. Because in the image of God, he made man. Dam Adam, Ba Adam, the Moishafech. So, blood of a man, we understand it's blood. But what's the blood of a man within the man? If it was just blood of a man, he would just say blood of a man. Blood of a man, within the man, we know it's the tamtit. It's the syrup. Seed. When he spills blood, his blood will be spilled. This goes all the way back to Noah. Proof. Fast forward. Genesis. Parashat Vayeshev, chapter 38. The story was the first story I heard about Torah when I started doing Shuvah from Rav Ephraim. The story of Judah and Tamar. One of the areas that we learn about Mashiach, by the way. But originally, Judah and Tamar were not together. Originally, Tamar was... Married one of Judah's sons. El was his firstborn. Vayi El bechor Yehuda ra beene Adonai vayemitehu Adonai. But Er, Judah's first son, was evil in the eye of Hashem, and Hashem caused him to die. Next verse. Vayomer Yehuda leonan bo el eshet achicha, vayabem otam vehakem zera leachicha, 
וידע אונן כי לא לא יהיה הזרה, והיה אם בא אל אשת אחיו, ושיחט ארצה לבלתי נתן זרע לאחיו. וירע בעיני אדוני אשר עשה וימת גם אותו. Then Judah said to Onan, consort with your brother's wife, you know, give, Onan was his second son, marry your brother's wife, because there was no kids, it's actually a uh, mitzvah, and enter into a leverant marriage with her, and establish offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the seed would not be his. Meaning that the son would not be his, he considered his brothers. So whatever, so whenever he would consort with his brother's wife, he would let it go to waste on the ground, aka bathroom, so as not to provide offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the eyes of Hashem, and he caused them to die also. Chazal says that El wanted, saw, appreciated the beauty of Tamar so much that he didn't want to ruin her beauty by having her get pregnant. He says, no, so for you, I'm just going to keep you pretty, but I'm just going to be with you. So you waste seed outside of her body. I don't want to have kids, like today's generation. No, no, I only have one kid already. It's enough. We can't afford a second kid. Hashem ran out of money. No, we have two kids and we got a dog. We can't. Maybe we're going to think, we're considering a cat also. Kid, no, we can't afford a kid with the yeshiva prices today. Huh? A nuclear family. No. Hashem <laughs> So Er wasted seed. As Hashem told Noah, not allowed to waste seed. In that generation, it wasn't too difficult to know that Hashem existed. Hashem killed him. Onan didn't want to have kids with Tamar because it wouldn't be considered his kid. He says, what do I do it for? I want to keep her pretty also. She's a very beautiful woman. I don't want to ruin her body. I want it to look like she's 20 forever. Okay. Enjoy. Hashem killed him also. This is also a source of why Goim also not allowed to waste seed. Because at this point we don't have Judaism. Noach. 12 tribes. They're not considered Jewish. They're B'nai Noach. Judaism was born in Mount Sinai. So here we have ourselves some Torah sources of why wasting seed is a problem. But what else does Chazal say? As we mentioned before, each time someone makes a sin, they create a demon. Chazal says, human fluids especially provide substance for demonic forces. It is for this reason that many sat satanic rituals require semen or blood. Most people that are crazy enough to worship the Satan, usually they have to spill blood or semen for it. Why? Because those things, this sp spilling seed, creates them. Now, you also tend to see that people that waste seed have a tough time learning. Here's a source. Part of the seminal fluid comes from the brain. This is sent down the spine. When a person spills seed, he is wasting away part of his brain. This lowers the function of the brain, especially memory. You can learn the Gemara 8,000 times. You're still not going to remember it. Just like Rav Avraham Steren said, the more seed you use, the softer your body becomes. And some of his patients, the zva, the disgusting nature that they got to, after wasting seed, in some cases, for only six months, doing it four or five times a day for six months, literally 
made them. Yeah, I know, it's crazy, but to a teenager, it doesn't seem like a crazy thing. Doing it a few times a day for six months doesn't seem like a long time. The person completely became crippled, eventually being found on the floor with blood coming out of every hole of his body. In another case, a person that was wasting seed for about two years, only about twice a day, only twice a day, for about two years, according to a different doctor, this is not even Dr. Sterin, it's just in that book, a Dr. Zimmerman said that he came to him completely in pain, suffering, unknown pain. The doctor understood that this is from wasting seed. He forced him to stop and he watched him over, he overseed him. He healed after several months. Got strong again. Young 18-year-old boy. Went back to it. Six months later, he was dead. His brain dried up. The cases get worse and worse. In many cases, the people were much crippled and had different types of disgusting fluids coming out of their body. In some cases, even lost control of their own seed. Or even if they wanted to stop, they couldn't. It just comes out. This is scientific, not religious yet. A person's emotions are thrown totally out of balance. People who are pogema brit often have a hard time controlling their temper. They're also subject of sadness and depression and lose their self-confidence. Anyone that wasted seed, this is like looking in the mirror. People who are pogema brit are also always tired and need more sleep. More often than not, they have bad body odor and breath. They also, according to the Rambam, they bald prematurely. Their hair growth starts in strange places. And their body becomes very weak. Where when you were 18 years old, strong, you're supposed to be able to lift a building. The guy can barely make it to the store. Someone who's a Pogema Brit loses almost all of his abil ability to perceive Kedusha. One also loses his desire to study Torah and do mitzvot. If you still have a desire to do mitzvot, it means it's Oh Hashem. Hashem has a lot of mercy on you, but you have to stop immediately. The souls brought down through the person's sins are also considered his kids. After a person dies, these souls come to take revenge against their father, causing him many problems. In addition, they also come after his physical children to try to harm them. This is the reason why when someone dies, they're not allowed, the children are not allowed in Jerusalem, they're not allowed to go to the funeral. Because if he ever wasted seed, those demons that he created will, could actually kill his children on the spot. There's actually an halacha against it. In the Kutei Torah, the Kutei 1, Torah 23, one who has rectified his breed, it is impossible for him to fall into the desire of money. If you do tshuva for Pekam Abrit, you have a promise from Shemaim, you won't fall for money. Meaning that you'll be able, even if you have a lot of money, you'll be able to control yourself. It's a very big upside. Because money, as I can tell you from my own personal story, very big test. It's a very, very big test. Likutei Torah. 29. It is almost impossible for a person to rectify his sins and all their aspects, for there are many. For there are many details and various aspects for every sin. However, when one rectifies his Brit, one does tshuva and become a Brit, which is the combining element of all channels, he automatically repairs the damage from all of his sins. Another big upside for doing tshuva. 
Having protection, Lekutei 1, Torah 31. Having protection during travel depends on Shmirat Abrit. Someone wants to be okay during a long trip, short trip, driving to, from New York to Florida, driving from New York to New Jersey. All depends on Brit. Someone who is Pogema Brit cannot pray with full concentration. It's impossible for them. Why? Because all the things that lead them to lose, to, to waste seed, are things they think about. When has the Satan come to you in your mind? When's the perfect time? Two places. Two times. Exactly when you are in Kedusha, which is prayer or studying. When's the second time? The wives are going to love this one. When he's supposed to be intimate with his wife. When he's intimate with his wife, that's when the Satan comes into your mind and reminds you of what you saw today. So in essence... Instead of being with your wife, you're thinking you're with someone else. If your wife actually knew, she'd probably divorce you on the spot. And there's actually Chazal that says there's even a safek on the child that comes from that. If it's a mamzel. Someone who's a pogema breed should be very careful to protect themselves from dogs and anything dangerous, from weapons. Because he already has a category, he created himself so many demons that are going upstairs to Hashem, telling him, look at this sinner, this Rasha Merusha, that's killing your nation every day. He's killing 300 million of them every day. When someone puts themselves in danger, that's usually when they go to Hashem, and Hashem Rechem. That's why in Shabbat, in the... Uh, Kabbalat Shabbat prayer, it says that there's a, uh, three reasons of why a woman dies during her uh, pregnancy. It's three things. Why pregnancy? Why not just a uh, regular day or Tuesday? Pregnancy is a dangerous time. Put yourself, you're in a dangerous time. That's when the kategor is going upstairs. You want to protect your wife? Protect your breed. <coughs> when a person, heaven forbid, experiences nocturnal emission, meaning it went out without necessarily him doing it, it stems from Klipa of Lilis. Should her name be her name should be erased. I told you who that is already. Each one of these is about 30 of them. I'm just giving you the top picks. There's 80 pages. We'll keep this one for later. Nightmares. Anyone ever have nightmares? Now you know the source. Nightmare is usually controlled by demons. Demons are created by that, by Pekam Ablit. Many of them, many, many of them. They could take two Torah five. For all you single guys looking for Zivug, sometimes because of the sin of Pekam Ablit, a person can actually lose his destined wife, his Zivug. When he was brought to this world, right before his neshama went into the little baby, Hashem already decided who his zivug is going to be. You waste enough seed, you lower yourself, you, you lower your spiritual standings enough, your zivug is going to go to an appropriate person, which is not you. How does he do tshuva? Tshuva is always open, Baruch Hashem. You bring yourself back up. That's the point of doing the shiul. Why does he Hashem knows. Don't worry. He created the heaven and the earth. He'll take care of that too. By fixing this sin, a person will find his destined wife. And on top of that, she will not be rebellious against him. 
Likutei Torah 87. Why is, she, why is he mentioning she would not be rebellious against him? Because like I told you, sometimes a person wakes up and his wife is mad at him and he hasn't done anything yet. He just woke up. Why is she mad at him? Because our neshama knows that he wasted seed. She can't see, but our neshama knows. Says wasting seed causes havoc in the spiritual worlds. What does that mean? Imagine a person is hired, not exactly a genius, to work at a nuclear plant. They don't need a genius, they just need somebody with a gun to make sure no one presses the red button. That's it. He doesn't know what the red button does. Tell them each shift is six months. You can't leave this building for six months. Fine. He gets the job. He sits there with his gun, talking to himself all day. Eventually he sees the cleaning guy. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? They grab a drink. Which, by the way, Chazal says one of the major reasons why you're not allowed to drink on a regular basis Get drunk is because it leads to wasting seed. This is Sefer Amidot 2, Shichrut. They hang out, have a few drinks. One day, cleaning guy is like, so what do you do? Oh, just look at this button all day. What's the button do? I said, I don't know. They just say it's a big deal. You want to press it? Yeah, why not? Let's see. I think they're lying to me. I think they just want to waste my time and torture me in this cell for six months. So, God, let's press it. So he starts pressing it. Come on, starts pressing it. He doesn't realize that each time he presses it, he launches a missile. A few hours later, a bunch of army men come inside with guns. Who's pressing the button? Who's destroying the world? Both of these drunk guys are on the floor laughing. And now they get the shock of their life. They're like, what? What are you talking about destroying the world? We were just pressing the button. They're like, yes. You fool. Each time you lost the missile, you launched a missile and killed 150 million people. That's wasting seed. That's Chilul Shabbat. You don't see the damage here right away. But in the spiritual world, you're destroying civilizations. When you arrive, without tshuva, you'll see. And a person that did it without doing tshuva would know that the place he arrived to is the Gehenom that he created for himself. It's no surprise. Rabbi Yochanan spoke up and said, All those who waste seed are punishable by death. It's karet. Ravami said, It is as if he sheds blood. It's murder. Ravashi says, It's as if he worships strange deities. Midrash Gadol Vayeshev. Rabacha Bar Yasha. Says whoever wastes seeds equates himself to an animal. 
just like an animal does not care what it does, so to this person randomly commits the sin. Just like an animal is set aside to be slaughtered and does not receive life in the future world, so to this person stands to die and does not live in the future world. Midrash HaGadol Vayeshev Masechet Shabbat, page 41. Major flaw of the generation of the flood, as we said, they wasted seed. Rambam. Was a doctor, aside from being a major sage, a major chacham, where we have all of our lachot from. He knew what he was doing. One that weighs seed, his old age jumps on them, meaning that they age much faster. At 18 years old, we look the same. At 25, he looks like he's 35. At 30, he looks like he's 49. At 40, he looks like he's 60. If he survives to 60, it would be a miracle. His strength leaves him. And his eyes go weak. You start losing your vision at a very young age. Bath, bad breath pours out of his mouth. Regardless of how many times he brushes his teeth, he always has bad breath. This is very common in today's world. His hair and eyebrows fall out. And hair of his legs and armpits become thick. And his teeth fall out or become weak. A lot of cavities. All of a sudden, when you were 18, you were a bull. By the time you were 25, you have worse teeth than your grandfather. What happened? You just took a shower, went outside for a half hour because of a little sweat. You sweat like, you know, you smell like you've worked a, a full day in a, uh, in a toxic plant. Many additional health problems occur. Shulchan Aruch 240, Rambam Dayot. I mentioned the sources so you guys don't think I made this up just for the fun of scaring you. This will be a good one for the mothers to know. One that weighs seed, heaven forbid, his children will die young or end up as evil people. It also causes poverty. Kitsur Shulchan Aruch 151. If a wife hears this and finds out that her husband wasted seed for a second, she'd probably torture him to death. Touch a wife's, touch a mother's children. You're playing with fire. That's why Rabbi Yochanan, when his students came to him on his deathbed, he said, Rabbi, Rabbi give us something. Give us some insight that we could take with us forever. He said, may you be scared of man, may you be scared of Hashem as much as you're scared of man. What? No, it's supposed to be opposite, no? Unfortunately, most of us don't have really Yad Shemaim. We're scared of men, we're scared of the cops at 3 o'clock in the morning that are pulling us over more than we're scared of Hashem that's watching every single thing that we do. That's what Rabbi Yochanan was teaching us. As we all know, someone reaches adulthood to a certain extent. For a girl, it's 12, and for a boy, it's 13, bar mitzvah. Until that time, any sin they make is their parents, which is the reason why one of the brachot, the father says that the boy's bar mitzvah is that he gets rid, you know, that I get rid of myself of this responsibility. Meaning that if the eight-year-old played with a video game on Shabbat, the sin goes to the father. If the 11-year-old girl ate chametz on Pesach, it goes to the parents. There's only one sin that goes to their account, to the child's account, 
to the boy's account. Under the age, at any age, whether he's two years old, if it's possible, or he's 11, or he's 12, or he's nine, wasting seed. Wasting seed stays on his account, doesn't go to his parents. Share Kedusha. Person under the age of mitzvot is not held accountable for his sins, except this one. For Ere and Unan were under the age and got punished. You remember the punishment they got a moment ago that I read. As we know, each of the limbs, each of the mitzvot, we have 613 mitzvot, is for each part of our, uh, each one of our body parts. Wasting seed defiles all of them. Each sin affects one body part, which is the reason why certain people that know Kabbalah, if you tell them something, if someone has a medical problem, you tell them what hurts, they'll tell you exactly what sin you need to rectify, what sin you need to do chufa for in order for it to stop. They know the body, they know the sins, they, they understand things that are not known in the medical world. But we're wasting seed, someone wastes seed, it's all of them. All 613 mitzvot. All 613 parts. If someone is praying a lot, he wants Yeshua from Hashem, wants salvation. Kadosh Baruch Hu, I need a job. Kadosh Baruch Hu, I need parnasa. Kadosh Baruch Hu, I need a wife. I need something. I need to stay alive. His prayers are not accepted. Waste seed. Prayer is gone to deaf ears. You can pray until from here to tomorrow. Won't make a difference. So, so is there a point to pray? Of course there's a point to pray. You can't make it worse. You can't make it better. It's not bracha levat alah, chas v'shalom, no. It's just that your prayer is not answered. Meaning you can pray. You're doing the mitzvah of praying. But as far as getting what you want, why are you, getting what, why are you going to get what you want? If every day you're killing 300 million of his children. So the prayers are not answered. Each time a person does this sin, he causes the creation of a numberless amount of klipot to take the image of pigs and dogs. So the demons the person creates apparently look like pigs and dogs. Someone that dies without doing tshuva of gamma brit, just so they know, they get to the... Uh, a genom, that's a waste, a boiling waste. We'll leave the genom part of that. I think you're scared enough, hopefully. something specific in a moment Each time a 
someone has something bad happen to him, they always blame God. David Amelech wanted to remind us of that each day. In our tefillah of Mincha, we read a Tehilim. Tehilim 25. After Amida. At one point it says, David Amelech is crying to Hashem. See my affliction and how much I struggle. For what sins? What sins did I make? Look at my enemies and how great they've become and how much violent hatred they have against, against me. This is the same thing as us. We lose a little bit of money. Girlfriend leaves us. Job's not good. This is not good. Complain to Hashem. What's the difference? David Amelach actually didn't make a sin. So he's actually asking Hashem, what did I do? Did I have these enemies? If you're crying to Hashem about all the things that are happening, you better be ready. You better have a really good reason. Because all you're doing when somebody is making the sin like this, making a worse sin, such as this, and telling Hashem, What sin did I make that you're punishing me like this? You get even more punishment for the chutzpah. <coughs> Why am I punishing you? You just killed 300 of my uh, boys this morning, another 300 million of them this afternoon, and you're planning to kill another 300 million later tonight? And you're asking me why you don't have any money? Money's coming out of you every day. As we all know, Parnassah comes from the children. People that are worried about having enough money to have kids, it's the, full, it's the biggest thing that people have no idea. Each child comes with a Parnassah. So that means that if someone has four kids, and they say, listen, I don't, know, I don't know if we could afford a fifth kid. Maybe we should go to the rabbi. Maybe he could uh, give us the uh, permission not to have any more kids, even though it's all four boys and supposed to do pool boo, supposed to be at least one boy, one girl. But maybe we can get a, uh, a discount or something from the rab. You could just say four boys is like one boy, one girl. You know, make a new halakha for us, special. We don't have money, Kvod Arab, we don't have money. Little do they know that the fifth kid that's waiting, that the neshama that's waiting in the chamber upstairs comes with a million and a half dollars. They don't know. Why? Because it's, they think everything is in their hands. The Parnassah is in their hands. Every time someone wastes seed, they're also wasting that million and a half dollars. They're also wasting the billion dollars. They're also wasting the, this world. Not just talking about the next world. Next world, Hashem Yerachem. They're literally creating themselves the worst type of Gehenom there is. One of these types of Gehenoms that doesn't end. Ever. People don't believe in eternal punishment. They think, nah, Kvod Arav. You're Machmir. Too much. Uh, where does it say in the Torah there's eternal punishment? Where does it say it? As we all know, we got Torah Bechtav and Torah Be'al Peh. Oral Torah and, and written Torah. You go to, I couldn't bring all of my books, so I have to put some on my phone. You go to Gemara, 
מסכת ראש השנה, פייט 17. A. Sounds familiar, right? And wrongdoers of the Gentiles who sin with their body. Also sounds familiar. Go down to Gehenom and are punished there for 12 months. This is, if someone, the reason why I even read this Gemara initially is because someone told me, no, look, see, first verse over here means that they just get punished for 12 months. If he would have read the rest of the Gemara, he would have a different understanding. This first 12 months is the trial. After 12 months, their body is consumed and their soul is burned and the wind scatters them under the soles of the feet of the righteous. As it says, and you shall tread down the wicked and they shall be as ashes under the soles of the righteous, of your feet. But as for the minim, minim are like uh, idol worshippers. And for the informers, and for the scuffers, who rejected the Torah and denied the resurrection of the dead. And those who abandoned the ways of the community. And those who spread their terror in the land of the living. And who sinned and made the masses sin, like Yerovam, the son of Navat, and his fellows. These will go down to Gehenom and be punished there for all generations. As it says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have rebelled against me. Meaning, Gehenom will be consumed by, they will not be consumed. Meaning Gehenom eventually will, be end, will end when the Mashiach comes. Eventually there's no more Gehenom. Except their part of the Gehenom. That continues forever. Why all this? Like why is such a dear punishment? Because they laid their hands on a temple. As it says, I have surely built there a house of habitation. As you can see, the wasting seeds fits several of the descriptions. So it's not just a pirush, like some people think. Almost done. Nigmara Masechet Nida, page 13b. They talk about this issue and whether a man is allowed to even touch that area of his body. They say, no, not allowed. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was also known as Rabbi, Rabbi Akadosh. Chazal asks, why is he called Rabbi Akadosh? Why isn't everyone else knows as a Kadosh? Because he never even looked at that area of his body. Even with his eyes he didn't look. Of course he didn't touch. So Chazal says, yeah, but what if how's a person going to go to the bathroom? You have to wear special pants. Okay. What about if you have a spike? Spike. Hurts. Gets stuck in that area of the body. Painful. Gemara in Masechet Nida, page 13b, says, It's better off that his stomach will blow up and he die, rather than him remove the spike from that area that's hurting him.
That's how careful they were to even touch the area. In the same Gemara, Masechet Nida, page 13a, Rabbi Eliezer says, it's better that one would tell everyone that all of his kids are mamzerim and get a lifetime worth of shame than touch his private part and waste seed. It's better that he gets shame. Everyone calls him, hey, hey, look, your wife was with another guy. Look, all your kids are mamzerim. Ha ha. And he can prove, no, they're not mamzerim, they're not mamzerim. So it's better that he gets that shame his whole life than waste seed one time. Shame is a big deal in Judaism. Someone who shames his friends in public, and lo chelik lo Someone who makes fun of somebody in public has no share of the world to come. We learned this from David HaMelech. So to accept upon yourself the worst possible shame that all your kids from another guy, your wife, is a harlot. So accept it. Just don't waste seed. Why was Yosef at Sadiq called Yosef at Sadiq and no one else of the 12 tribes? We learn this from Gemara Sota. He's called it Sadiq because he didn't waste seed. It's so much so that when Potiphar's wife, the Gemara says, Potiphar's wife came on to him and Joseph almost sinned. He almost sinned. But then he saw the image of his father. Reminding him that if you make this sin, one day when they have the Choshen, for the Kohen Agado, they're going to have to engrave the names of the 12 tribes. Your name will not be engraved. It's reminded, he gave, he gave Yosef at Sadiq some Yerat Shamaim. Reminded him of what the sin is. The Gemara says he took his hands and he buried them into the ground, like forcefully breaking his hands. All the way to the point that miraculously the seed that was supposed to come out of that organ came out of his fingernails. Just don't waste seed. He's called a tzaddik because he did not waste seed. He protected his breed. The other 11 tribes did not protect the breed, apparently. A tzaddik, we learn from Sefer Yirmiya. I think it's chapter 19. maybe. Ah. Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 19 Vim to tzia kal mizolel kepitiye This is a verse I mentioned last night about Kiru which we'll embellish on a little bit later But from here it says if you bring forth an honorable person from a glutton. So we learned that an honorable person is a tzaddik. Someone did tshuva. Someone who did tshuva is considered yakal, honorable, precious. The opposite of yakal is something that's as far as, is obviously cheap. But here we're not talking about price. The opposite of a tzaddik is someone that's a rasha. So if you take the word yakal, which is yud, kuf, resh, and you change the order of the letters. You spell the word keri, which is what we talked about, which is wasting seed. The yakal, the numerical value of yakal, is 310. What's 310? Is the amount of words that a, a amount of worlds that a tzaddik gets in Olamaba. <coughs> gets 310 worlds. That's what a yakar gets. 
you can figure out what the keri gets. Sefer Kabbalah wants to scare us a little bit more. It says that each time a drop of seed is wasted, there's a bad angel that takes the one drop, not the whole thing, just one of the drops, and uses it as a, as a hostage to give the Tumah more power against you. So, looking bad, smelling bad, aging fast, growing hair in strange places, losing years out of your life, losing Olam Abba, eternal punishment, demons, nightmare, in so many words. Time to stop. How do we stop? Why stop? Aside from being scared to death. How do you do tshuva for something like this? So a few things. First and foremost, tshuva is you have to stop immediately. You cannot continue the sin one more time. Someone starts, they don't do it for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, they fail. The is to make sure that you have to protect your eyes because if you don't protect your eyes if you don't watch if you keep watching movies you keep looking at these magazines keep watching stupid videos on the internet you do all of that stuff you're bringing gain home into your life there's no way to avoid it there's no way to avoid it you watch you know how they call the Israelis call it Shotef Tainayim you wash your eyes with looking at other women, you're bringing gain home to your life. Even if you want to stop doing it yourself, it's going to happen to you at night. What you have to do is you have to start looking at the floor. You can't walk around looking at every, like, a, you know, one of these uh, puppets that, you know, shakes their head. You buy at the baseball games. You have to start watching your eyes. Yeah, it died again. It's okay. Uh, the phone's recording. Let's see how long that lasts. Satan doesn't want to see you online. This, doing chua for something like this, this is something uh, that could save a lot of people. Doing chuva, you have to first start with watching your eyes. Second of all, you have, you have to start practicing not touching at all. Limit it as much as you can. I know, normally, it's tough for a guy and so on. You have to do whatever you can. Whatever you can. Especially if you're single. If you're married, Baruch Hashem, you have your wife. If you're single, if, I, if, you, if, if there was a way to not go to the bathroom, I tell you don't go to the bathroom. Because when you're single, it's almost impossible. The third thing is, if you're single, you have to find yourself a wife. Stop being one of these losers that's uh, 40 years old, still looking for the perfect woman. Find a wife, be a normal person, don't worry about it. You'll be, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll develop love over time. I'm serious, there's a bunch of guys that I went to school with, this, they're in their 40s and 45, they're still looking for the perfect one. Where are they looking for? In clubs. <laughs> no, I couldn't find the perfect one, I thought I had it. When? 20 years ago. Okay, what about now? You're 45 years old, what are you waiting for? Find a woman, settle down, get a wife, that's it. She doesn't have to be... Uh, 
you know, the number one person on earth. Just find somebody, settle down, you'll develop love over time. If you guys have something in common, if you could tolerate each other, if you could have connection, you have chemistry, that's it. It doesn't have to be a uh, Marilyn Monroe and, uh, you know, and one of these other, I don't know, Brad Pitt or something. It's just normal people. Build a family, build a future. Just have something in common. That's it. It doesn't require this, this shiduch crisis that we have today. It's all because we can't watch our eyes. The men can't stop looking at not immodest women. So they think that the tzaddikah that just came from Beit Yaakov is supposed to look like a, the prostitute he saw in the mall. And the woman, unfortunately, she, you know, some women are very materialistic. Why? Because they watch TV. They look at these magazines. They see that all these celebrities have this and that. So the guy's chasing money so he can keep up with the girl's expectations. And they both drive each other crazy. Crazy. There shouldn't be a shidduch crisis. There's plenty of men. There's plenty of women. I have every single day someone asking me if I have a shidduch for them. How could it be? There's guys that want shidduch. There's girls that want shidduch. Why? You can't meet each other? What's the problem? Find yourself a wife. If it's not because of anything else, it's to stop this sin. Stop this sin. I'm telling you, it's, it's such a horrendous sin. I had a lot of health problems. Anyone that wants to know my personal story, you can watch last night's shiur. It's online. Bezat Hashem will be online tonight. I know suffering. One thing I understand is suffering. I had many, many years of suffering. Pain and screaming and surgeries and pills. All types of wonderful suffering. Baruch Hashem. I know what suffering is. I'm an expert in suffering. You want to know what Gainom looks like? I could tell you. In this world, not the other one. I know what it looks like. I know what suffering is. You don't want it. You don't want suffering. It's, it's, it's a nightmare. You got to get yourself a wife. It's number two. If you don't have a wife, get yourself a wife. Work on it. Work on it. it has to become, aside from learning Torah, it has to become number one. Number three... Just as the Rambam says, only type of people that waste seed, spend their time on this stuff, are people that are empty-minded. They have no chokhmah. They have nothing in their head, so they're bored to death. And boredom leads to sin, like Shlomo Melech told us. Can't be bored, can't find yourself bored. What do you got to do? You got to go learn Torah. Stop, stop being a batlan, doing nothing with your life. Watching sports is boredom. Watching television is boredom. You can watch TV for nine hours and not even realize nine hours passed. Because your neshama went to sleep. Your body is just dead. Nothing happens. It's the shell, whether the guy died or he lived, whether the team won or not, it doesn't affect your life. You're just wasting your life. You got to spend time developing your neshama, developing your brain. Ariya Kadosh here says, you want to rectify all the seed that you wasted you have to sweat for mitzvot because each drop of sweat that comes out of your body from a due to a mitzvah is fixing one drop of seed that came out of your body so in in uh in uh simchat torah you should be the guy that runs around and sweats his eyes out with the torah celebrating for the mitzvah you're supposed to be happy Run around, have a good time. If it's hot in the kolel, you should study even extra. Hot in the yeshiva, study extra. Sweat doing a mitzvah. Literally, sweat. Because each one of them is mamash helping you out. Most important thing is you have to learn difficult Torah. Learning nice tzipurit sadikim, listening to a nice story, yeah, it's fine, it's good, it's not bad. But for this sin, you have, to, you have to choose your suffering. There's two types of suffering as far as this chuba. It's either suffering by your choice or suffering that's not your choice. So it's either you force yourself to learn difficult gemara and pretty much to the point of ripping your hair out of your head and struggling at 1.30 in the morning instead of going and get uh, eight hours of sleep, you only got five. Because you struggle to learn some Torah, or Hashem is going to give you different suffering. You don't want that suffering. You have to struggle. That's what Amal Bat Torah is. 
אם בחוקותיי תלכו, אורח חיים, one of his 42 פירושים says, אם בחוקותיי means עמל בתורה, means difficult Torah, learn Torah, that's difficult, that's not easy, במדרשים, it's nice, סיפורי צדיקים, is nice, little tape here, little CD there, it's all nice, but if it's easy for you, it's not going to fix the sin. It's good for Torah, but not enough if you have the sin like every, pretty much every single person that's alive today. A few things and I'll finish. This is really more for the women than anything else. Every time the men look at women, they're not really doing her any favors. A woman walks around like a prostitute and doesn't want to wear any clothes. Or the clothes she does wear is like becoming like a second skin. It's so tight that you can pretty much tell exactly what she looks like. She has to understand that each time she walks around like this, the demons are following her. Why? Because she falls into this description. Mishnah, Pirkei Avot, 521, says, It says, Whoever influences the masses to become meritorious, meaning to do tshuva, shall not be the cause of sin. Someone is doing Zikui Rabim, organizing lectures, giving lectures, giving CDs out, publicizing Torah, trying to get people to do tshuva. Hashem is going to give them special protection. Hashem is going to help them in a big way if they're not making this major sin. Making this major sin, you're cutting your connection with Hashem. But one who influences the public, influences the masses to sin, will not be given the means to repent. A woman that walks around, a immodest woman walks around, she doesn't realize that every single time she walks around, it's not really the problem that she walks around that way. God doesn't actually care whether you wear a tank top, or you wear a tube top, or you wear nothing, or you wear modest clothes. It's not that God knows exactly what you look like. He created you. It's that every single step that you take is another guy looking at you and every single second that he looks at you is a sin. Every time he sins, you and him create a demon. And neither one of them ever leave. So a woman that goes from Avenue 15 to Avenue 20 thinks, oh, she looks cute. With her new mini skirt. She doesn't realize just from Avenue 15 to Avenue 20, a thousand men looked at her. She just created a few thousand demons for herself and for them. Who wants that problem? We all have enough problems in our life. What do we need this for? She becomes a machtia rabim. She becomes one that makes the public, the masses, sin. People don't understand. It's not about Hashem caring what your, clothe, what your clothing style is or not. He cares about His children. And He cares about what His children look like and how they behave. This is why even Goyim must be modest. Because if a Goya walks around immodest and she makes a Jew sin, Hashem Rachem on us. It's a, it's a major problem. She has a major, major problem with Hashem. Hmm? Exactly. But it's even bigger when she's making one of his sons sin. So for example, in the Torah it mentions that anyone that makes a sin with an animal does bestiality, which in Hashem's eyes, by the way, is the same exact thing as homosexuality. That's why they're always together. They're always next to each other in the Torah. Homosexuality and bestiality, even though in this generation it seems like it's almost both of them are normal, but at least... Being a homosexual is accepted. You know, they even have parades for them. Uh, but in reality, in Hashem's eyes, 
It's not accepted. And he sees it as the same thing as being a man being with an animal, a woman being with an animal. And he says if a man makes a sin with an animal, or a woman makes a sin with an animal, you kill both of them. Now, okay, fine, you kill the guy, I understand, he's crazy, he doesn't deserve to live. What are you killing the animal for? What, the cow winked at him? Why, is he, why are you killing the animal for? What'd she do? Chazal says, because Hashem doesn't want to look at her and be reminded that for her, he had to kill one of his sons. Understand? So, Hashem Rechem on the woman that walks around, immodest, and Hashem knows that because of her, he has to send a bunch of his sons to concentration camps. So people don't understand how modesty is so important. We made a lot of sins throughout our generations. Hashem had mercy on us in every single generation. He had mercy on us. He almost destroyed us several times, but He had mercy on us. He loves us. We sinned with the golden calf. He had mercy on us. He gave us a warning. We sinned with the man. He gave us a warning. We complained. He gave us a warning. Idol worship gave us a warning. Before the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, we got countless warnings. The second Bet HaMikdash, we got countless warnings. Before he punished us, we got countless warnings. Except once. Only one time in the entire Torah, only one time in the entire history, did we not get warnings. Parashat Balak. When Balak and Bilam tried to curse Am Yisrael, Bilam's curse did not work and turned into a blessing. So he told Balak, listen, I can't curse them because their God protects them. But if you want to beat them, send all your women there. Send all your immodest women over there. No kisui rosh, mini skirt, tight jeans. Send all of them over there. Why? Their God hates zima. What's zima? Zima is immodesty, prostitution. As soon as the women arrived, Am Yisrael sinned. And within a matter of minutes, Hashem started a plague without a warning. You're going to learn about it in a few weeks. In Parashat Shavua. In a matter of minutes, Hashem killed 24,000 of Am Yisrael. And it only stopped because Pinchas, the grandson of Aaron Cohen, took a spear and put it inside the two leaders, Zimri and with the leader of the women also. Salu. Uh, so here we see this punishment which is different. Even though idol worship seems really bad. It is. Chilu Shabbat, really bad. Complaining to Hashem, bad. Everything is bad. When we do anything that's against Hashem, it's bad. But immodesty, Hashem says, you're killing my children. You're machti rabim. And this is why you see today Hashem Rachem, so many women getting so many dis different diseases. Where are they getting these diseases? In the sex organs. Where is the number one cancer for both males and females today? In those exact areas. Right. The areas for women, the areas for men. Private areas. Where the, where, the, where the disease is. Hashem is telling us, it's like, well, Hashem, Hashem is telling us, you have to act like Jews. Not, uh, not like the people of Sodom. Not like the people of Noah. And that's why women have to work on their modesty and they also have to work on their husbands. You have to make sure you do not allow your husband for one second to look at other women. It's never okay. Ever. Because you're protecting him. If he, if he starts doing it, children are going to do it. 
And that's the thing. It's just once a kid starts with it, Chazal says there's almost no way to do tshuva for wasting seed. Why? Because it's the biggest addiction there is. It's more addictive than, than crack. So much so that this, this Rav that wrote this medical book 190 years ago, Rav Avam Sterin, said that even when he told the guy, listen, I cured you, now you made yourself worse. If you continue wasting seed, you're 100% going to die. One after another, after another guy continued and continued until they killed himself. That's how addictive it is. So you have to overcome it. It's a big deal. It's a big deal in Hashem's eyes. And it's also a big deal in Hashem's eyes that you don't get men to do that. If a woman is responsible for a guy using that as an excuse for wasting seed, she's a partner in the crime. And that's the big thing that people need to understand. It's not Hashem. This is going to be a wake-up call for whoever could hear this year full length and actually get some Yirat Shemaim. Because the biggest compliment that Hashem gave to Avraham Avinu after the Akedah is now I know that you're scared of me. After he passed ten tests. Ten tests. He was just about to kill his own son for Hashem. Shem stops him. Says, no, no. Don't put your hand on him. Because now I know that you fear me. So fear, unlike what this generation thinks, is not only a good thing. It's a compliment. After Avraham Avinu died, he called Avraham my lover. But during his life, he called him and said the highest level of compliment he told him is that now I know you fear me. Fearing Hashem is the foundation, it's the beginning. You have no fear of Hashem. The shear is not even relevant to you. Nothing's going to help you. You have to develop fear of Hashem. Pay attention to Him. Notice Him. There's not Hashem. You believe in Him and you follow what He says. Any questions? You have questions. I know as soon as the camera's off, so you guys have to have questions. Usually when the camera's on, no one asks any questions. Camera's off. 500 questions. Yesterday, I think I said questions. Nobody asked any questions. I shut off the camera. We stayed there till 2 o'clock in the morning. The, um, there's even more sources, but I think you guys get the point. Say, uh, on the girl side, you have to make sure that your husband knows this information so he doesn't ever think it's okay. You have to make sure that you're not the reason why anyone else is ever going to be a sinner. Not just your husband, but anyone else. For men, it all starts with keeping your eyes clean. And you start working on Yirat Shemaim. To get Yirat Shemaim, you have to learn stuff like this. You have to learn Gvara, you have to learn Musar. Regularly, every day. Not once a week is not enough. Even if you learn for 24 hours a day, one day a week, somehow, and the other six days you're not learning, it's not enough. It's better that you learn two hours a day than everything in one day. Every day, because your neshama needs food every day. Not just once a week. You know, it's like if I told you, listen, don't eat every day, just eat once a week, but eat the whole day. Steaks, one steak after another. You won't survive. You need to eat every day. Yeah, there's a few teilim. There's a few teilim that uh, uh, that you can say. It's not necessarily a bracha. There's a few teilim that I'll, uh, if you want, text me and I'll send them to you. That you can uh, say to, to help you as far as protect your eyes. But the, uh, the biggest thing, the biggest thing that you can do to help yourself with, with Brahma Brit is when you learn Torah, especially difficult Torah, your your brain starts working differently, and just like the uh, the Rambam says in a uh, here actually it's Ilchot uh, Yisurei Be'a Perik Perik Twenty Two, Alacha Twenty One, when the same place that he said that only an empty brain makes this type of sin, in essence he's also telling us that if you 
fill your brain with Torah, you're never going to be bored. If you're learning Torah every day, even if it's only an hour, two hours a day, your brain is always going to be functioning. Oh, you know what? Yesterday, Rashi said this, or you know, your brain's always going to be working on that. If your brain's only working on business, on the material world, very easy to sin. But if your brain has some Torah in it, on a regular basis, it's going to function differently, and you're not going to think about that stuff. But obviously it requires some work. You have to do it every day. So Torah, especially difficult Torah, and obviously difficult, not just it's difficult and you never understand it, but difficult until you understand it, um, is the type of stuff that's going to fix your brain and neshama and get you away from seeing all of the stuff thinking about it uh, in all ways. Um, second thing is obviously have a good relationship with your wife. If you're mean to your wife, then you can't blame her for not wanting to look at you. Uh, you know, some guys think that the wife is like a, uh, a slave or something. I don't know what happened to this world, but people treat their wife like they think it's a plant. They can move it wherever they want. You, know, you have to treat your wife like a human being. Uh, you have to Take care of yourself. You can't expect her to be excited to be with you when you don't take a shower more than once a week. Uh, you know, you have to take care of yourself. Same thing with women. This is, I'm telling you guys, this is, what, this, is, this is the type of stuff I hear. No, I don't want to be with him. Why? He smells. Okay, well, take a shower. Why can't you tell him? No, I feel bad telling him. Uh, who's going to tell him then? <laughs> who's going to tell him? Who's going to tell him? Tell him, listen, I, I refuse to be with you because you smell. Okay, so the guy's going to start taking showers ten times a day. He wants to be with his wife. This is the, if he's not going to be with his wife, he's going to sin. So the wife, thinking she's nice to him by not you know, hurting his feelings, being politically correct by not hurting his feelings, she's leading him to sin. Enough with the political correctness. Tell people with the truth. You could say it in a nice way. You could even say it in a funny way and joke around privately. But say the truth. Be, you know, be, just say what it is. Enough with this garbage that's in the world with all this political correctness. No, I don't want to hurt the feelings. Why hurt the feelings? You're telling the guy something that's going to help him. Okay, so the surgery is going to hurt. I understand. But if we don't do the surgery, the guy's going to die. What are you going to do? I know it's going to hurt. The recovery is going to hurt. The surgery is going to hurt. Everything's going to hurt. But eventually he's going to live. It's better that it hurt now and be better later than no later. So tell people the truth. The biggest thing that you can do for all overall connection to Hashem is take care of His children. In a woman's case, two major things. One, modesty. You have to be modest. There is no other option. You have to be modest. If a woman, if you're married, you have to cover your hair. Not with a wig that reaches the floor. Kisui rosh, appropriate, look modest, don't drag it, you know, grab the attention of the public. The only one that should see your beauty is your husband. The wigs of today are not kosher. Even the rabbis that say that wigs are kosher, or used to say that wigs are kosher, uh, would never say that the wigs of today are kosher. Because the wigs of today look better than natural hair. So it's nonsense. No one, no big rabbi in the world today agrees with today's wigs. No one. Even if you tell me, no, but his own wife wears it. Okay, he has his own problem. doesn't mean anything. Someone came to Rabbi Vadya and said, Rabbi Vadya spoke against wigs all the time. So there's, there's no place in the Torah that says you're allowed to wear wigs. Whoever said it is making a mistake, you're not allowed to wear wigs. I said, yes, but Kvod uh, your own uh, granddaughter is wearing a wig. It's like, yes, there's place for her and Gainom also. It's all a problem. The human hair part is because it comes from Avodah Zarah most of the time. There are different traditions in Tibet, in India, and different places in Asia that it's part of idol worship to, uh, to uh, take off their hair. Idol worshippers. It's idol worshippers. Outright idol worshippers. It's part of the tradition to cut off hair as part of idol worship. So women that wear wigs in many cases are using idol worship. Where you're not allowed to benefit from idol worship in any way. Even if it's a gold statue, you're not allowed to benefit from it. Not allowed to use it, not allowed to sell it, not allowed to look at it, nothing. So of course you're not allowed to wear it on your head. But aside from that, it's not modest. It doesn't meet the basic requirement. It's not modest. 
So women need to understand, yes, I know this is a big tikkun in this generation. No one wants to cover their hair. Everyone wants to look pretty for, the, for, for Steve and Mikey at ShopRite. I understand. But your husband's more important and God is more important. Steve and Mike is gonna look, are going to look at you know, some other uh, girl. They don't have to look at you. Your husband should look at you. Yeah, that's it. Cover your hair. Cover your body. Your skirt needs to cover your knees after you sit down. Not before you sit down. Then as soon as you sit down, it goes up and becomes a mini skirt. That's not, that's not modesty. Skirt, ideally, should cover your ankles even when you're sitting down. But even if it can't, the point is, is that it needs to cover your knees at the very minimum when you sit down. But not like going like this every three seconds. You know, there's a lot of women. You go to like a wedding and it's like every two seconds they're all you know, doing sit-ups at the chair. That's not, that's not a... Uh, that's to cover it normally. And also, it's not supposed to be that tight. Why? Because if it's tight, then anyone with eyes can see exactly what your body looks like. It has to be loose. That's what modesty is like. That's what Hashem said. It's not me. It's, if it was up to me, I'm a guy. What do you think a guy would want? It's not. Before we did tshuva, I would tell my wife, don't wear any clothes. I had no concept. I was an animal. I'm telling you, this is what Hashem wants. Shirts have to cover the elbows at all times. Neckline needs to be covered. Obviously, you have to act like a human being. You can't talk like a truck driver. Speak like a lady. And guys, for heaven's sake, if, if you're wearing skinny jeans, stop it already. It's mamash, like, enough. And aside from that, Whoever you know wears it, tell him something. It's just not appropriate. It's not. It's, it doesn't look nice. I don't know who thinks it looks nice, but eh, whatever. I guess it's a taste situation. You gotta stop it. I don't know. It's it's just it's just one of those things. Which, by the way, whoever doesn't know who actually made this style popular, it's not exactly the Mister Righteous made this style popular. It's a uh, guy named Lil Wayne. He's not the ideal Jew or anything. He's not uh, Yosef HaTzadik. He's the one that actually made it really, really hip, and then obviously other superstars followed, and I think he eventually graduated to just wear women's pants because the men's pants weren't tight enough. I'm serious. So, if you're a nice Jewish boy that fears Hashem, wants to fulfill your purpose in the world, why are you using this guy as, a, as an example? Who wants to look like him, Bechlal? We're Jews. We're not goyim. We have to stop acting like them. They're not even supposed to act like that. But nonetheless, we have a higher we have a higher uh, responsibility. We're supposed to be a light to the nations. This is why anti, uh, Hashem uses anti-Semitism. Uh, because with anti-Semitism that there is in the world, we still have huge, huge amount of assimilation. Huge amount of anti uh, of uh, intermarriage, huge amount of Jews not keeping anything because they feel like Tommy and Joey are the same as them. Huge amount of people n with no interest whatsoever in God, huge, and it's funny because the Jews are supposed to be the most religious people. We find ourselves as the least religious people. So you have to tell each other something. You got to tell each other the truth. You gotta do chuva, and you you build on top of it. There's always chuva is always available. It's always available, but you have to be serious. You have to be genuine. And with something like this, for guys, gemara, learning tough stuff. That's the secret. Stopping it, obviously. And if you're single, get yourself together, find yourself a wife, and bezat Hashem, all of you do very soon. Bauch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'Amen.